This happened when I was a kid. I was laying in my bed, the door to the room right in front of me wide open, and to the left, I could see the room where the front door was. An empty cabinet stood there that my dad had got, when all of a sudden, it began illuminating a white glow. I began to freak out for no reason and began sweating. I knew something weird was about to happen and that I was going to witness something. And about five minutes later, laying hot in sweat, I saw it. There was a door in the back of the room with the front door that was storage. A black, outlined, humanoid figure walks out, mildly staticky looking. It took a few steps towards the front door and then stopped. It did a military-like turn to face me, and at this point I'm freaking the hell out, eyes wide. It walks into my room and stops beside my bed. There's one more military turn facing me, and at this point I figured I've got nothing to lose. I nope out of there and ran through the thing, ran upstairs to my parents' bedroom and knocked furiously at the door waiting for them to let me in. My eyes were focused on the stairs making sure it wasn't following me, and there was nothing. I ended up sleeping with my parents for the next few nights after that. One of the scariest things that happened to me as a child was that. A short time after the shadow people encounter, I began to settle down, and my thoughts were no longer fearful. I also believe this was during the time I put a dream catcher up that my mother got me. Let me just say that the dream catcher really did the job for years, Maybe because I truly believed in it, and my mind worked in its favor. Good old placebo effect. I woke up one morning to my mum yelling down the stairs to get me. It was a school day, and I had a shower. Came back to my room and sat on my bed, sluggish, slipping my school uniform on. This is where it got down. As I was pulling up my socks, I noticed a flash outside my door moving towards the room with the front door. Not the bright camera type flash, but more like an invisible person walking past super fast. For those of you that played Halo, it looked like someone walking around with the invisibility cloak, but really fast. You can still see them, just not entirely. I saw this from the corner of my eye and began freaking out. I went upstairs to eat breakfast, and I remember how scared I was. I sat there, staring down at the table as I ate my cereal. My mother asked what was up, and I looked at her with a straight face and said something along the lines of, I saw a flash by the door downstairs. Something walked past my door. I said it calmly and with a straight face, and now that I look back on it, I must have looked like the classic creepy kid. My mum simply responded, it's all in your head. I went back to eating, and she went into the laundry room behind the kitchen. And that's when it happened again. I was eating and saw another flash of an invisible person walking past the kitchen door. This time I was paralyzed, as in I stopped chewing, and now was staring straight down at the table. They were playing with me, I thought. My mum walks in, stop, sees my reaction, and again I calmly say, it just did it again, over there, pointing at the kitchen threshold. I tell my mum that something's playing with me and that I'm not imagining things. What really relieved me but freaked me out at the same time was her reply, I know. It relieved me because she believed me, but then again freaked me out more as she confirmed their existence. About 10 seconds later, we both heard someone walking down the stairs, wooden, so creaking can be heard. It happened very slowly, and I remember thinking to myself that it sounded as if the cover is blown and they were trying to sneak out. My mum and I both looked at each other, and once we heard it stop, she looked around the corner down the stairs. Nothing. And Dad had already left for work. This next story is set in the Philippines, where I've heard many stories from my relatives about paranormal things happening in the house we stayed at. This is something that I've experienced myself. This happened in the second story living room. 
This living room was huge, tall ceiling, about 20 by 45 feet worth of room. It was during Christmas time, and we had a tree set up in the middle of the room towards the north side. A large Jesus table on the east side positioned north-south, and there was a television set up on the west side, with a large green velvet couch about 15 feet in front of the TV, and another couch set up sideways to the TV, but backed up against a sliding door to the balcony. There was enough room for someone to walk behind the couch to get it open, the screen doors to the balcony. Anyway, my Filipino cousin, as I myself am half Filipino and I, were gathered around the TV. Some of them were on the floor, one on the back of the couch and me on the couch by the sliding door. We were all watching a game show. At this time, it was getting late for us, perhaps 10. So here's where it goes down. I'm sitting on the couch with my legs up and one knee up. The remote is dangling on the backrest, edge to my right, and I hear it drop behind me. So little me, being the ninja I am, slides over the top of the couch on my back like a bridge stretch for your back, with my face pressed up against the glass. I grab the remote, and from the corner of my eye, I see a young girl with black hair. She was wearing a white dress, and as I was looking down, I didn't see her face. She was in the crawling position, backing up as if she'd been caught trying to escape. She was backing up towards the middle of the room, towards the Christmas tree. I was still upside down at this point, and when I managed to look over at her, she disappeared. I scuttled right back up and jumped. All of my cousins looked at me weird. I then explained to them what I saw, and they all started basically shaking and pointing their finger at me as if they knew that I must have done something to see something. We were all smiling though, as if it was something normal. To this day, I still think they were just messing with me, the whole, you got in trouble with the supernatural, but I know what I saw. I've always felt scared when I was in the Philippines, especially in that house, in the area we lived in, Betis. This house was like a mansion, it was opposite some baseball courts, in case anyone knows Betis. If anyone ever goes to the Philippines, ask the locals for supernatural stories. I'd imagine everyone there has experienced something, as all my Filipino relatives and the maids. One maid even ran away because of an encounter. She came back, and I met her one time, but she hates talking about it, unsurprisingly. This started two nights ago. I'm hoping someone can give me advice on what's going on. I have nyctophobia, though outside at night doesn't bother me, like the inside of a dark house or room due to childhood trauma. So on one side of the room, I have white Christmas lights dimmed down for a bit of light at night. Luckily, it doesn't bother my fiance. He could sleep upside down in a hurricane. So two nights ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and went to the bathroom. I couldn't get back to sleep after, as I have bad insomnia, and was just laying in bed bored, debating on just staying up all night, but was pretty much just staring at the ceiling and chilling, waiting to get tired again. All of a sudden, it was like every sense I had yelled danger, the hair on my body stood up, goosebumps all over, and I was overwhelmed with fear. I can't exactly describe the feeling, but have you ever been put in a dangerous situation? Maybe you'll relate to it. This is where things get weird and confusing. There was a figure in the doorway, except I couldn't see it clearly. It's a little hard to explain. So my senses were telling me, hey, there's something there, but my eyes couldn't really see it very well. I could follow it with my eyes. I could sense it, but I couldn't exactly see it. It's hard to explain. Now, whatever this thing is, it wasn't like a solid shadow, but it wasn't like a human in shape, as far as I can tell. It was... Sort of like a mist or smoke, not very tall, kind of hard shaped, as if someone had a sheet over themselves standing there, that kind of shape. Well, it went from the doorway to the other side of the room at the end of the bed. It didn't walk, it more teleported. It jumped from place to place. Meanwhile, every part of me is telling me to run and that it's dangerous. Then I see it go from the end of the bed to my side of the bed. And at this point, I sit up, and my senses are going nuts. 
I can, and also cannot see, whatever is there as it moves to the end of my bed directly in front of me. My instincts are saying danger, and every part of me is telling me to move now. I didn't, because as I said, I could see it but couldn't at the same time. So going by what my eyes see, I thought maybe I'm just kind of overreacting. A few seconds later, it lurches at me, and the best way I can describe it is that it jumped onto me or into me. I couldn't yell, I tried. I was shoved back on the bed, and the feeling was like being hit with static electricity. It was covering my entire body. I managed to throw my arms out, smacking my fiance and grabbing his chest, basically grabbed onto him for dear life, and he jumps up confused and half asleep. He sees me scared out of my mind and the thing fades. I couldn't talk for a while and could move and explain to him what just happened, and he hugged me until I was able to fall asleep. Last night I had a similar thing happen, but this time I tried to really focus on whatever it was with my eyes. Because once the feeling came over me, I knew it was something I couldn't really do anything about. This time I focused and it went to the top left corner of the bedroom, and it was more shadowy this time. It darkened that corner of the room slash ceiling, which isn't too far from the end of my side of the bed. I sat up ready for something to happen and it again jumped on me. I managed to grab my fiance who was already awake. I still scared the hell out of him, but he didn't see anything and I was alert and fully awake, but wasn't talking. And the electric weird feeling in my body lasted a while before fading this time. But it didn't move like the night before. It was basically at the doorway. Corner of the ceiling then bam right onto me. It happened so quickly. Was it just trying to figure out what to do or observing me before jumping me? I'm not sure. I tried to sage weakly at the least. Now I've had experiences, all kinds of paranormal stuff happened to me while growing up in a haunted house. I believe in ghosts and all that. And I've been told by a few people that due to the things that have happened and continue to happen, there's a chance I'm possessed or at the very least have something negative attached to me, which wouldn't surprise me at all. I've been experiencing nightmares and stuff like this over years. So not knowing what to do, I think I'm gonna try and have my dog look after me. Let me tell you a bit about him in fact. Our dog is usually crated at night in the winter because the bedroom is the warmest of the house. He has a big fluffy foam bed and his own blankets. And I worry if he gets too cold in the living room at night. He's a 60 pound German short haired pointer who was a total bed hog and loves to literally push you off the bed. My fiance is a pretty big guy, so it gets a bit crowded with our dog on the bed with us. Now my dog's crate is against the wall and faces the end of the bed, so we can always see him. The second night that the thing in my bedroom jumped into me, it first was in the corner of the room on the ceiling, which happened to be directly above my dog's crate. He was locked in his crate that night, as he was the night before. After sharing on Reddit, my fear got the best of me, and I wanted the comfort of my dog next to me for the night. We were just gonna deal with the overcrowded bed, and the first night we let him on the bed, he fell asleep between us. I woke up with a bad feeling, and could sense something was watching me, but I didn't have the same experience as the previous nights. I knew something was there, but it wasn't moving around and didn't jump at me, so I tried to ignore it the best I could. Our dog decided to get off the bed and go into his crate. I think he was a bit annoyed at the crowded bed, that's my guess anyway, and he was able to go in and out of his crate freely. Nothing eventful happened, and I eventually fell back asleep. Now we come to what happened last night, and last night was a lot different than the previous. So I'm thinking because nothing crazy happened when my dog was able to go from our bed to his crate, that maybe whatever this thing is doesn't like my dog. I have no idea, but it was something for me to try again. So we decided our dog would be sleeping with us and we would deal with the crowded bed once more. I mean, if I can get some sleep and not worry about whatever this thing is, then I don't care about crowding. Well, I woke up in the middle of the night. It wasn't before long that I felt something like the previous nights. Total fear, the urge to run, goosebumps, my hair standing on end the whole nine yards. Our dog is in between us and alert. He's sitting up, 
and there is this invisible, non-invisible misty form thing. This time it isn't moving. It's just going around the bed, still kind of vanishing and appearing and not moving smoothly. My dog was looking at it. So I was happy that he saw it because that means I'm not losing my mind. But at the same time, I'm extra scared because I have to accept the fact that my dog is seeing something. So this thing is moving around the bed and it starts coming to my side little by little. And I'm just pulling the blankets over my head thinking maybe it will go away. I'm lying on my side facing the wall and my dog is behind me between me and my fiance who was dead asleep by the way. I turned my head around to peek out to see what my dog is doing and he was looking towards me. I turned my head back still under the blanket. My senses are yelling danger. Part of me was saying, don't look at it because who knows what could happen. I don't know what this thing was jumping on me again. Right in front of my face was that form that had been stalking me and I guess I could almost say attacking me. Needless to say, I was beyond scared and ducked my head back under the blanket. I felt that static feeling, but it wasn't like before and not as strong as when it jumped onto me and it knocked me back. It was different somehow. It wasn't harsh when it jumped, almost making me feel like I was electrocuted. My instincts were screaming danger and the urge to run was overwhelming, but nothing insane happened. So I decided to just stay under my blanket and I could feel my dog moving on the bed, but I knew whatever it was was still there and still watching. I could sense it there clear as day. I stayed up a good while, but stayed hidden under the blanket and eventually fell back asleep and woke up numerous times throughout the night, but didn't have another experience with that formal thing. The one thing I came to realize this morning is our dog didn't leave the bed at all last night. He stayed with us on the bed all night, and that's when my fiance got up to let him out of the bathroom this morning, and he didn't get off the bed, and it took both of our encouragement to have him leave my side. What could this thing be? It makes me wonder if it was worried about our dog, and that's why it didn't jump on me. When it jumped on me before, our dog was crated. The night before last, it was just watching me, and my dog was on the bed and free to go into his crate, which at some point he did. But last night, it was like this form stalked me very close, didn't jump at me and just circled around our bed watching. My dog was able to see it. So it didn't leave my side. So what do you guys think? Yesterday, we got some devastatingly bad news. It could be coincidence though, I suppose. Is this a spirit, a demon? How can it be it was nervous or scared of my dog? It kind of seemed like it was worried and stayed at a distance. And then last night, it decided to get closer to see how the dog would react. Or maybe it's wishful thinking, I'm guessing. Could it have been a creature that could just camouflage itself? Something demonic? A spirit? What do you think? I would seriously like some advice, as I just want it to go away. A few years ago, I lived in a small village on the Cheshire slash Staffordshire border in the UK. We were incomers and brought the brand new property because we liked it, not for historical reasons. For a few months, everything was normal until my next door neighbor excavated their garden, trying to level this very steep plot. The workmen uncovered the entrance to a stone tunnel leading away into the hillside. Then, strange things started to happen in my house. It started with an upstairs bathroom, the room closest and at the same level with the entrance to the next door's tunnel. I'd been gifted with a set of plaster seashells. These things were large and heavy, weighing about a pound a piece. They had little wire hoops to enable them to be hung on the walls. I was alone when I heard a thud from upstairs. Three of the four shells had come off the wall. Shoddy DIY skills, I thought, except one of the shells was across the room and tucked neatly and unbroken behind the toilet cistern some 10 feet away. I had no explanation, but being practical and unflappably English, thought there must be one and dutifully hung all the shells back on the wall and carried on. A few days later, I was getting ready for work. My son was already at school and my husband left for work some hours before. I showered and changed into my uniform 
but when I leave my bedroom, I can hear voices. The volume is so low, I can't make out the words, but there's definitely a pattern, like a distant conversation. My boy was very young at the time, so I figure he left the TV on somewhere. I check, nothing. No TV, no radio. Windows are all closed and locked, so it's not just music from a passing car. I check, but neighbors workmen haven't arrived for the day, so it isn't them. I even go outside and check, but can't hear a thing. There's no explanation, but there could be. My husband is a firm skeptic, so I don't panic and don't call him to beg him to come home, which is what I wanted to do. I think someone might have gotten into the house, but I had to unlock all the doors myself to check outside. I even checked the garage in case someone had sneaked in that way, but no. I'm telling myself, it's voices being carried on the wind, echoes sound off the buildings and stuff. I'm truly freaked out. My heart is pounding and I'm shaking, but I'm grown up and I go back inside to the kitchen that has been a place of calm and peace just seconds before. In the 30 seconds or so I've been outside, every cupboard and drawer in the kitchen is open. Some wide open, some just a crack, but every single one is open as if someone was curious to see what was in there. I was understandably freaked and I slammed everything shut and fled. A few days later, the neighbors decided the cool stone tunnel was too unstable to keep as a feature and the tunnel was gonna be filled back in. Nothing ever overtly happened in the house again, except a few weeks later, I was chatting to the neighbors over the fence and I complimented them on their new garden design and he laughed and said that although the tunnel would have been cool, the several ghosts that he had parading through his house were too much to handle. It appears that the tiny virtual no-name village had been the site of a major battle during the War of the Roses. Queen Margaret had watched the battle from the local church and while the fields and streams close by had run red with the blood of her soldiers, she had the shoes of her horses turned around and escaped, killing the blacksmith in the process so he couldn't tell what she'd done. I don't know if that small hand dug out tunnel had been an escape route for the queen. I'm a skeptic on so many paranormal stories as I have absolutely no proof but it really did happen to me, and I still don't have any explanation. My mother died when I was nine, in a car accident caused by a drunk driver. Me and my older sister Karen moved in with my father, and my two younger sisters moved in with my stepfather. I want to start this by saying, I truly don't believe it's my mother that's doing the haunting and that this has all been caused by my own stupidity. But now, I don't know what to do. When I was a senior in high school, we moved into a tiny three bedroom house. It had a creepy basement with no outside entrance, but on the outside of the door was a chain lock, right about the doorknob, which made no sense. Right off the basement door was the back porch, where you would head through to get to my bedroom, and then you walk through my bedroom to get into my sister's room. My cat, who was more obsessed with my sister than me, refused to go into my sister's room. She would hiss and freak out every time I tried to walk her towards the back of the house. Once, one of my friends brought over their dog, and I put my cat in my room for safekeeping. I went back in there 15 minutes later, after they left, and the whole room was a mess with her running around, and there was piss and poo everywhere. She had never done anything like that before. There was another time when I was laying in my room, and my sister was laying in hers, and the door between the rooms was slammed shut. She threw open the door and started yelling at me about shutting the room off. When she saw my face, she realized it hadn't been me. I slept on the couch, and she slept at her boyfriend's house, and basically moved in with him after that. In a moment of divine teenage stupidity, my friends and I decided to use a Ouija board. We only used it for a moment or two. We opened the board, started, and got freaked out because we felt like we were being watched. 
we closed it off and put it away. It wasn't even a week later that the basement door chain was ripped off and there were gouge marks on the door. A week after that, I went into my sister's room to grab something to take to her as the room was covered in gnats. I couldn't find anything that would cause it. Family issues led to me moving in with my stepfather and little sisters right after. It was only a two bedroom house, so I slept in the basement in a small nook and my sister Penelope slept on the other side. I would often hear the sounds of footsteps stomping overhead, even if I was the only one home. I saw a shadowy figure standing at my dresser that would vanish after I turned the light on. One night after a bonfire, my friend stayed the night. I sat up in bed because something was standing at the entrance to my little nook. They were dark and I couldn't make out any features. I watched them for a few moments, but they didn't do anything, so I shook her awake. She asked who they were and tried talking to them, but they didn't respond. So getting freaked out, she turned on the light and the moment she did, they were gone. We walked upstairs to find out it was almost 4am and everyone was asleep. Needless to say, we slept on the couch that night and I slept on it pretty often after that. Not long after graduating, I moved into an apartment with my now husband, Ben, and became pregnant. We would hear doors shutting, which isn't super strange because we lived in an apartment. So obviously you can hear your neighbors. Sometimes I could hear whistling at the back of the apartment and at others, I would hear my daughter giggle over the baby monitor when she was learning to talk and sometimes referring to someone she called Nana. Once our burner turned on and burnt breakfast leftovers that had been sitting in the pan. I know it wasn't us because we had breakfast at seven and it was 11 a.m. by the time I realized something was burning and it was turned up all the way. We bought a new house around the time my daughter turned three and everything was fine for two years. But I recently just had a new baby and things have gotten weird again. The first thing I noticed was my first day home alone with the baby. I was sitting on the couch singing to her and right above me, I heard what sounded like stomping or someone walking up or through my attic. Obviously there's no one up there. So I brushed it off for sleep deprivation. But now my daughter's four months old and sleeps way better through the night. So I know I'm not tired. I often hear the sound of doors shutting and toys going off when I'm the only one home with the baby. My dog always runs to check out the noise, so I know it's not just me hearing things. I have stepped outside to have the door shut randomly behind me when the girls are napping. We've had cups fall and break out the cabinet in the middle of the night. My husband works out of town a lot, so I'm alone at night with the girls and often get the feeling that I'm being watched. I sleep with a pocket knife next to my bed as a family had their life ended the night I gave birth to my daughter four houses down. So it's not that crazy in my opinion. But what drove me to share this was that last night I woke up from a dead sleep because I heard my baby crying. It was followed by a soft hello and shushing noise and my baby started to calm. I relaxed for a second thinking my husband was taking care of it. But then I felt him shift behind me. I have never bolted out of bed and grabbed that knife so quickly in my life. I threw my door open and my dog was sitting outside the baby's room watching the door. The baby was still awake in her bedroom by herself, her cheeks wet from tears, but her pacifier was in her mouth and she was just looking around. She's four months. She can't put a pacifier back in her mouth after crying. I checked the house. It was all clear. I didn't sleep the rest of the night and spent it scrolling the internet to find out if anyone else has had this problem. No, my husband doesn't believe anything's happening. He doesn't believe in this kind of stuff. He thinks there must have been interference on the baby monitor. I still don't think it explains the pacifier or the stomping or the doors being shut. I just don't know what I should do. Whatever it is doesn't seem to know if it wants to burn my house down or nanny my kids. 
or maybe it wants us gone from the picture to have the girls to itself. I don't know what to do, or what to think. I'm 26 now when this all started when I was 18. Any advice or help would be so amazing, and I would be so grateful. I really, simply, do not know what to do. I'm about a 25 minute drive from Anderson, and I have a few experiences to share from when I first moved to Indiana. My mother was on her way home from a concert when her GPS led her down a small dirt road between two cornfields. She ended up in front of a large tree, in front of a hidden cemetery, and she told me about it after she turned around and tried her GPS again, this time successfully making it home. I begged her to take me, and she, my older cousin, and I decided to check it out. She asked some co-workers about it, and apparently a farmer had hung his wife in that tree, and her GPS led her to it. We were a little freaked out, but we took several photos on our old digital camera. My cousin informed us that we were a few minutes away from Crybaby Bridge. We had heard stories and decided to go check it out as well, but didn't experience much at the bridge aside from an uncomfortable feeling, and were a little bit disappointed. And on our way home, we passed an abandoned barn diagonal from an old church. So we pulled over and took some pictures. When we finally got home, we uploaded the pictures to our laptop and adjusted the brightness and contrast and discovered the face of a little girl peeking from behind one of the headstones in the cemetery. We discovered an abundance of orbs surrounding the barn and upon doing research, learned that it was actually a common ritual site for Satanists and pagans and other spiritual groups, and that the cemetery didn't show up on maps. There were simply no known coordinates for it. It's been 11 years since I've been to those places and I really wanna go back and see if anything has changed. One thing's for sure though, Anderson is creepy as hell and crawling with negative energy. Years ago, I used to work at a church as the head sound engineer. The bulk of that job required me to be active during the day for church services. Occasionally there would be tasks that could be done whenever I got the chance. One of these tasks was duplicating CDs of sermons for people who would like a copy to listen to at home or in the car. I would get requests for various sermons, sometimes series spanning months, and have to make extra time to fulfill them since it usually took quite a while. And since I am a night owl, oftentimes I would head to the church and take care of these duplication requests in the middle of the night. It never bothered me, and I had a key to get into the church whenever I needed to. On one particular night, I headed into the church sometime around one or two in the morning. Since I knew the building like the back of my hand, I rarely turned on the lights inside the building. The ambient light from the street lights would illuminate through the windows just enough so that I could see where I was going. But beyond that building was pitch dark. Now, the way this church was laid out was there was a foyer, which then had doors into the church sanctuary where the services were held. The sanctuary had a balcony and on this balcony was the sound booth, where the CD duplicator was located. There is only one door to the balcony, which could be locked from the inside, which was also located in the foyer, with a staircase leading up to it. The balcony is completely open and not separated by glass or anything, and provides a completely unobstructed view of the sanctuary below. The pews, stage, all of it. Acoustically, the room is very good. If someone was on the stage talking, you could easily hear it from the back of the church and balcony. If for some reason you couldn't see what you were listening to, you could easily make out what part of the room the sound was coming from. This comes into play later. When I reached the top of the stairs to the balcony in the sound booth, I turned on a light so I could begin working. Just a single bulb about 15 feet above my head, and I had no need to turn on anything more than that. This was the only light in the entire sanctuary. I know that might seem crazy to some, but this was a building I had spent hundreds of hours in by myself at night, and I felt completely comfortable at the time. 
I began duplicating CDs, lost in my thoughts, and the peaceful silence of the enormous room. After about an hour or so of silence, a sound abruptly rang out that startled me, about 20 to 30 feet ahead and below of me, in the middle of the pews on the left-hand side. I heard a distinctive clink sound. It was subtle but clear and unmistakable. Over and over, I knew exactly what that sound was. You see, in another part of the church, we had a coffee house of sorts, where people would load up on coffee and donuts every Sunday morning. The coffee was always dispensed in ceramic coffee mugs, literally the most basic mug you can imagine. Your kitchen cupboards are likely full of them. And due to the high volume of these mugs that circulated through the churches, there were always baristas from the coffee house picking them up from around the church to be washed. Oftentimes they would miss mugs, however, and they would lay hidden around the church, as multiple mugs were usually collected in one hand by the handle. Mugs themselves would hit and make that distinctive ceramic clink sound. It became regular background noise before, during, and after services. And after about 10 years of working at this church, it's a sound I knew and recognized very well. But I would be lying if I said I ever consciously thought about that particular sound. So I find myself trying to process why I'm hearing coffee mug clinking together in the middle of the night, in the middle of our church sanctuary in the pitch dark. I stood there peering from the balcony into the darkness below, trying to make sense of it for several minutes before curiosity got the best of me. I had to figure out what was making that sound, so I descend on the stairs into the foyer where the light switches were and flipped them all into the on position. I immediately felt a little better and entered the sanctuary on the ground level. I had pinpointed where the ceramic sound was coming from and where I was on the balcony. But unfortunately, now that I was at the source with the lights on, there was nothing to be heard. It was midweek, but the sanctuary had not yet been cleaned from the previous Sunday, so I knew there were still probably a few coffee mugs inside. People frequently left them on top pews, underneath them, and everywhere in between. I walked down each row of pews, carefully scanning for mugs. Nothing. Knowing there would be likely some on the floor, I got down on my hands and knees in front of the very sanctuary so I could take a peek. From this perspective, I could see underneath every pew and each respective side at once. Sure enough, there were a few mugs scattered throughout the floor, underneath certain pews, and I got up and moved to those specific pews and examined where each mug was. In hindsight, I probably should have picked them up, but I didn't, because technically that's not my job but I did take note of the most important fact. There were no coffee mugs in close proximity to each other. The closest were three or four feet from one another, not even remotely close enough to clink. While I couldn't explain the sounds I heard, there was no logical explanation for how those mugs made those sounds. I had no answers, but was satisfied enough to just brush it off and left the sanctuary, turned off the lights at the light switch in the foyer and returned back up the stairs to the balcony, illuminated by just a single light bulb above me, and consoled by the silence I found myself in once again, as I resumed my task. About 15 minutes passed. Then it happened again. The clink sound, in the same place as before. My heart stopped, and the hairs on my neck stood up again. Okay. I had verified this myself. There were no mugs in enough proximity that they could somehow, for the sake of argument, be clinking on their own. They were not clinking on their own. I rushed down the stairs into the foyer and flipped on all the lights again, entering the sanctuary. I dropped to my knees once more and peered under the pews. Nothing. I knew this sound, it was unmistakable. I pinpointed where it was coming from, but there was nothing. No sound, nothing in disarray, no mugs that could be in any contact with each other. Spooked, but frustrated at the same time, I returned to the foyer. Instead of turning off all the lights, I left one on in the sanctuary. This made for two lights now, one in the balcony and one in the sanctuary. 
The addition of this light helped set me a little more at ease as I walked through the balcony door at the bottom of the stairs. I locked it from the inside. I didn't know what was going on and maybe I was being a little paranoid at this point, but I wasn't going to take any chances. I went up the stairs once again to attempt to finish my task on the balcony. About half an hour of silence had elapsed, just enough for me to settle into the idea of nothing weird happening for the rest of the night, when it happened again. Clink. It might as well have been a gunshot. I stood up and scanned from atop the balcony. There was twice as much light in there now, and enough to illuminate the room, even if it was dim. But there was nothing. Nobody was playing a prank. There were no ghouls, spectres, or shadow people dancing around. No big, aha, revelation. Clink. It continued. And so did I. I wanted to go home, so I ignored it. The sooner I finished duplicating these stupid CDs, the sooner I could be out of this damn church and get some sleep. Clink, clink, clink. Again and again. Maybe another 15 minutes, maybe another half an hour or so. I lost track of time. All I know is that eventually it stopped. The silence returned. At one point, I resolved that this was ridiculous. There had to be a rational explanation. And as such, it was stupid to hold up on my balcony. I went downstairs to get something to drink. On my way back, I flipped off that remaining light in the sanctuary. No need to waste electricity. I reasoned I'm not going to let some stupid sound dictate my fear all night, and returned to the balcony and left the door unlocked. Illuminated once more by my single light bulb, I popped in a few more CDs. And then it happened. I don't even know how to effectively describe it, at least in a way that captures the immediacy and sheer terror of it. All at once, the entire room began to shake violently with a deep, bassy rumble. There are no earthquakes in this part of the country, so that was immediately ruled out. Time seemed to stop, as I scanned around trying to figure out what was going on. I looked at the soundboard. You know those LEDs they have going from green to yellow to red? The thing was maxed out to red, indicating it was overloaded by some sort of input. But there were no mics plugged in, no amps turned on, and no sound coming out of the speakers. I don't even think the speakers were plugged in. And if they were, they certainly were muted. At the time, I had done professional audio for over five years, and this wasn't something technical. The entire sanctuary rumbled and shook for about 30 seconds, and then it stopped. And I was left in complete silence and completely shaken. And I bolted out of the church and went home. I don't have any explanation for what happened, since there were no ghostly things to show themselves or any supernatural power. I have tried... I come from an Indonesian family, one quite proud of its roots and one always keen to latch onto something closely related to Indonesian history. When I was much younger, my mother had bought a Wayang doll. It used to be used for puppet theatres in Indonesia, and are said to have their own personality and vices. The doll quickly becomes the pride and joy in our house, a centrepiece on the mantel, smiling and looking over the room at all times. It had stood there for a year, with never any bother. That was until my mum started seeing her now husband. The doll quickly got an eerie feeling to it, but nothing too unusual. When things got serious between my mother and stepdad, and he moved in, things started to get a bit freaky. It started off with picture frames falling off the walls and mantelpiece. Initially, not thinking much of it, just kept putting everything back in its place. Slowly, I kid you not, the face of the doll turns its grin into a frown, turned unpleasant to look at, but still all seemed innocent. One night, we had all gone to bed. Normally, we had candles on the mantelpiece, blew them out, 
and went upstairs. An hour or so later, smoke started to creep upstairs. My mother let out a yelp, calling us down. The doll was on fire, having its arms stretched out in flames, no candle lit, a completely dark room aside for the doll. It cast the scariest shadow on the wall before my mum threw a bucket of water over it. Through all of this, to this day, it still sends a shiver running down my spine. We got a family member to get rid of the remains and never saw it again after that night. When I was five, the night before my father died, I had a dream about going over to his apartment with my mother. When we got to the building there, there were police cars and an ambulance. My mum was not talking to the police, but went up to my dad's apartment. When I went in, it was weird because my dad wasn't there, but on one of the door frames was a bungee cord, and that is all I remember from the dream. I knew when I woke up in the morning that my dad was dead. I wasn't surprised when anyone told me, and people thought I didn't understand. I cried about it, and has messed me up in ways, but I knew what had happened. For many years, everyone just told me he had died, and not that he had taken his own life. Until I was around 10, then they told me the truth, and my sister confirmed that he had done it with a bungee cord. I've also had dreams many years ago about exact moments that I have had now at work, or about people I've met. It's kind of weird, but it also makes me think I'm going in the direction I'm supposed to. The following is a true story that happened, but have no conventional way of explaining it. When I was four years old, my family lived in military housing in Winnipeg in the early 70s. I had an older brother, six at the time, and a younger brother who would have been one year old. Our house was a bungalow with a fairly conventional layout. Living room, kitchen, dining room, and one end of a rectangular structure and bedrooms and a bathroom connected to the hallway at the other end. One day I was sitting in the hallway where I would see my parents in the kitchen and could also look down the halls towards the door to the bedroom. No one was down the hall other than my one year old brother who I think was sleeping in his room. I was looking down the hall when I saw something impossible. There were two bedroom doorways on the left side of the hall. What I saw came out of the door on the left closet to me, about eight to 10 feet away. As I watched, a skeletal arm slowly emerged into the hallway horizontally at my eye level until the elbow was almost showing, but not quite, and then slowly retreated into the exact same fashion into the room. I remember that the bones looked very real. I know now that they were the color of real bones and were clearly not any kind of plastic replica. The arm bones seemed to have been the size of an adult male's. I knew for certain that we didn't have anything that resembled these bones at all in the house. I also knew for certain that my older brother was not in the area of the house. I could see my parents in the kitchen, and it was unlike them to play such a scary prank on a four-year-old. And I don't know if I can explain it, but it was clear by the smooth and steady movement of the arm that it wasn't something being held by someone. It looked as if it were attached to the owner. My impression was that the arm's owner was aware of me and was deliberately revealing itself to me in a non-threatening manner. Despite my age, I knew that what I had seen was just extraordinary. I noted that it was the middle of the day and I was sitting wide awake. And of that I'm positive, there simply was no explanation. I wasn't terrified as one would think. It just simply happened and was done. I had zero interest in going down and looking into that room to see what was there, but perhaps the apparition was an invitation to do so. I didn't tell my parents, don't ask me why, but you know they wouldn't have believed me. Nothing like this has ever happened to me since this event, and there didn't seem to be any other strange occurrences in the house. A couple of years ago, I finally thought to ask my parents about the house in Winnipeg. They said they hadn't noticed anything strange there, but the previous owner had died while in military service overseas. So there it is. Me and my only experience that I can say with 100% certainty, and will go to my grave believing that it was an authentic paranormal event. 
This is a brief account that I had almost a year ago in the warehouse where I worked alone. No one I've told has believed me, but perhaps all of you will. I work in a warehouse that my father purchased. He bought it for 25% of its cost from a farmer who seemed very excited to be rid of it. It's in the middle of Mennonite country, with no neighbors for half a mile around. Look out the window and you see cornfields and scraggly trees. Cell service? Forget about it. I work here alone, painting and prepping the front office portion for eventual functionality. To get to the front office, you have to go through a hallway from the main warehouse into a secondary office, and then through another door into the front. I frequently hear bumps and thuds, and occasionally will go into the warehouse and feel air movement, but I've always attributed it to the drafts and animal life in the roof. The only thing that has ever made me uneasy about the building is the fact that all of the doors and locks are reversed. Whoever installed these locks did not intend to keep people out. They intended to keep something in. It never really got too freaky until one day when I was in the front office. I began hearing thudding. I ignored it and continued to apply masking tape to the door I was working on. But this time I was accompanied by a screeching sound. Not loud, but audible. I was freaking out, but convinced myself that it was just a pissed off raccoon or squirrel that had found its way inside. I continued working. That is, of course, until I heard the slam. The door to the secondary office had been open. It sounded like it had violently slammed shut. I peeked around the corner and saw I was right. The secondary door was now closed. I had tried to logic it through my head that a strong draft had sucked it closed, although I knew there to be no such draft. The thud began again, close this time, and I've never been able to put a proximity on it, but now it sounded like it was on the right side of the door. I froze, unsure of what was happening, and my eyes locked on the door handle, which began to turn. The door disengaged its latch and slowly swung open, wider, wider, but there was nothing there, nothing visible, no air movement, just quiet, so quiet. A quiet that seemed to overwhelm me with its presence, a quiet so thick I couldn't breathe. The quiet was shattered when the screech came again. This time it was clearly human, pained, angered, and emanating from the main warehouse. The door slammed. That entirely broke my frozen, fearful state. I ran. I got into my car and drove until I was within cell range to call my father. He didn't believe anything about the doors closing, but agreed that the building had something weird about it and told me he'd be right out. Fast forward half an hour. My dad and I met up and drove back to the warehouse. I showed him the door that slammed, showing him how it was separated from both the front door and the main warehouse, so no draft could have closed it. I told him about the thuds, the screeching, and the sudden quiet that overcame the building. He decided we should check the main warehouse. Emboldened by his presence, I led the way. Something you should know about this warehouse. It was formerly a furniture manufacturing place owned by a Mennonite farmer. They made handmade chairs and tables. Because all of the cutting that went on, the floor is thickly coated in dust. We walked into the warehouse and saw nothing out of the ordinary. The dust was untouched, the doors were closed, windows were locked, and the only thing out of the ordinary was one of the hanging fluorescent light fixtures. It was hanging askew and swaying slightly. Insisting we take a look at mount it to ensure it didn't break loose, my dad grabbed a stepladder. He supported it while I climbed and grabbed the swinging light. I looked on top of the light and saw a handprint, a single fresh, inhumanly large handprint. No footprints in the dust around the light, no signs of a presence. So I climbed down and switched places with my father and he saw it too. How could that be? There's been no one here for years, he said. He climbed down and told me he'd been suspicious of someone breaking in and stealing parts from the warehouse light system. He couldn't believe me that this wasn't human, that something wasn't right here. The last thing he said was, there's nothing here, 
Next time, just go back to work. And then, as if to show its presence, the thud returned. This time, it wasn't just a thud, but more of an earthquake, and the entire building felt like it moved. The heartbeat like thud was then overlaid by the screech, the awful screech. It felt like it was coming from the walls themselves. We ran, and I haven't returned. My father hired someone to finish my job and has since moved into the office. He heard the thudding, but thus far nothing has happened further. What actually happened? I don't know. Nor do I care to know. What I do know is that there is something paranormal in that building, and the man who sold it to us knew it. I'll never forget the sound of that lock turning by itself, and the feeling of the thunderous silence. My boyfriend Luke and I went on holiday to Mexico in April six years ago. Upon coming back, I was going through our suitcase to wash various items of clothing and came across a tiny statue of what looked like a woman on her knees praying to the sun. Uh, okay. I asked Luke about this, and he said that him and another guy from the group of friends that we went with were out and saw it leaning against a tree stump. Him, being him, thought that this statue was the best thing since sliced bread, and he shoved it in his suitcase to bring it home with us. I thought this was weird, as the statue itself was made from wood and wasn't very flattering. Luke placed it on the table in the hallway, in between our Yankee candles. I'd say about a week later, I was coming downstairs through the hallway and into our living room, when I noticed that it seemed colder by the table. I took this to there being a draft coming in from the front door and made sure I shut the living room door behind me in an attempt to keep it from coming in there. Small things started to happen. My keys that I always put on a hook in the kitchen would be in the middle of the living room floor resting on the rug when I would wake up. We have no pets and I know Luke wouldn't do something so petty to try and mess with me. I had to keep changing light bulbs in the hallway. The phone that was also on this table would go off randomly at all times of the day. I'd answer and hear static. Sometimes I'd hear faint mumbling over it. There were times when I would get ready for bed and just about to lay my head down on the pillow and I'd pull out that wooden statue. Somehow it had made its way under my pillow and this happened at least five to seven times. I was home alone one night, watching TV in the living room when I saw a shape of black smoke in the hallway lingering there as if it were watching me. It was in the TV reflection. I dared not move my head towards it and acted like I was totally engrossed at the show I was watching. I could see it from the corner of my eye though, but was too afraid to move. I saw it slowly fade away and move further into the hallway. Me being a big baby, I didn't move and carried on watching my show. I brushed it off with that if I show no interest, perhaps it would go away. When my boyfriend got home, I asked him if he wanted to go grab McDonald's to get a McFlurry. He jumped at the chance. I wanted to get out of the house to talk about what I saw. Sitting there in the car park, I blurted out the events of the night. He sat quietly. I expected him to not believe me and laugh. But Luke said that he had seen the smoke too. But sometimes it was in the doorway when he woke up. He would rub his eyes and it would still be there then vanish. We thought about the timeline and realized that all of this happened shortly after finding the statue in the suitcase. That night when we got back, we took the statue into the garden and burnt it. Nothing happened since, and the house somehow feels lighter and warmer. This story is from my childhood. My parents had moved into a new house after marrying, and after three years I was born. I was six years old when it started. I had my own bedroom by six because my mum wanted me to practice sleeping on my own. 
On my first night, I had no trouble since my insomnia hadn't developed yet and fell asleep peacefully. I find myself waking up. See the clock, it's 1.23. I wasn't used to staying up that late, so I started trying to sleep again. And then I heard the tap. I go to the bathroom beside my bed to turn it off. I thought it was just a malfunction with the tap and try to go back to sleep. Then I hear the toilet flush. I ignored it and went back to sleep. And for the next two years in that house, things like this would happen. The toilet flushing, door closing by itself, taps turning themselves on and off. And to this day, I don't even know the story behind it. Okay, this next story is my cousin's. So, my cousin went to my grandma's house to stay for a few days. She'd recently moved into the apartment and she saw an apparition in an empty room. And after asking about it to the landlord, he replied with, oh yeah, a person died in that room and somehow was super chill while saying it. My cousin, of course, was horrified. My grandma's husband, AKA my grandpa had passed away and she saw an apparition of him, which she described as a figure wearing a white dress while smiling. The smile was so warm and beautiful that it filled her heart with joy. It was very weird listening to that, honestly. Also, apparently my grandpa was some kind of magician who would do amazing stuff. My grandma and dad would tell me stories like he could make water float in the air by chanting some kind of spell. And apparently the apartment above mine, which I live in now, had some kind of crazy stories. The apartment is actually still uninhabited to this day since no one wants to live in a place with so many ghost stories. And you can actually hear screaming and laughter from the apartment confirmed by me. And if you rang the doorbell, the door would open. Lots of neighbors said they've tried it and it works. My best friend and I have been friends ever since I was about five or so. And the first time I came over to her house, I noticed that her mum was very happy and carefree. Also very nice. This story is about her. The layout of her house is important to the story. They have a screened in porch and besides it is an open porch with a deck and stairs. Down those stairs, there's a small forest. And by small, I mean you can see the homes on the other side in a driveway. Anyway, my friend's mom loved nighttime, especially in summer when she could go outside. We were very young at the time and being the normal seven year old girls we were, we were terrified of the dark, the monsters under the bed, the bogeymen that lived in your basement or under the stairs, all that stuff. We were very big on cuddly stuffed animals and nightlights. Her mum would always tell us we weren't afraid of the dark. We were afraid of what hid in it. Well, I think she may have changed her outlook on this since then. She had only recently told us this story when we were about 13. She hadn't told us at the time it happened as we would have been far too young and there was no reason just to scare us. A while back, there was a solar eclipse, not the famous ones everyone talks about. It was going to happen in the early hours of the morning, like 3 a.m. My friend's mum went outside in her pajamas, but didn't think to bring a flashlight as she thought total darkness would just add to the experience. Or she can't say it didn't, that's for sure. Right as the eclipse was about to turn everything completely black, she started hearing whispers from the woods, very soft at first, and she couldn't make out what they were saying, possibly a foreign language. And then everything went dark. They got louder, almost like a thousand people were whispering all at once. She stood there frozen for a second, unsure what to do. So she did what any sensible person would do, ran for the house. Keep in mind, it was still pitch black, so she couldn't see. The only thing she could do was hope she was going in the right direction. Just as she started running, she heard the whispers chasing her and something started tugging at the end of her pajama pants but never touching her skin, but trying to pull her back. She managed to escape and the eclipse ended and she was able to see well enough to find her way back to the house. However, when she went back into her room, she heard someone laughing with an Irish accent and another man in the same accent talking in some drunken gibberish she couldn't understand. She went to sleep with my friend's dad. He had gotten kicked out of her room for snoring. 
nothing happened for the rest of the night. The next morning, she visited her friend across the street and asked if anything strange happened during to her during the eclipse. Her friend described the exact same thing. My friend's mum has never been outside alone without a flashlight since. You know, I bet this time she's glad that the dark hid everything evil that was trying to lure her there. This is a story that my grandmother shared with me one cold winter night. The electricity had gone out and it was the perfect atmosphere to share some ghost stories. When I asked her if she had any strange experiences, she recounted one night from her childhood that she never will forget. It occurred when she was really young, around the age of eight or so. Her and her older sister were down playing by the small creek on the border of their property. They went down and played often, trying to catch frogs and other stuff. Well, one night, just as they were making their way back up from the creek, they thought they heard something. So they turned around, curious to see who or what they just heard. It was a faint rustle in the bushes. They peeked as hard as they could, but couldn't see or identify anyone. Odd, they thought. And so they carried on walking the way home. They could see their house and were just ascending the hill to reach it when they heard a lard sharp sound. It sounded like a stick being hit against a rock. When they turned this time, they saw about three or four young little children staring at them from behind this rock. They gave them a quizzical look, but weren't afraid. And my grandma actually approached and asked the children if they were okay. They just stood behind the rock, motionless, and said nothing. My grandma's sister began approaching, and just as she was about to reach the rock to ask them something, did all of them vanish into thin air. It's like they were there one minute, and the next, they simply were not. She says that her and her sister looked at each other, with that look in her eye to just confirm that they had both witnessed the exact same thing, and without uttering a word, ran home, and never spoke of it again. For quite a long time, neither of them had any intention of speaking about it. But as the years passed, curiosity got the better of my grandma. And when she asked her sister about what she saw, she indeed confirmed many years later that they had seen the exact same thing. She then mentioned something that my grandma had overlooked. But that's why she didn't like going down to the creek after that. a puppet, almost identical to this. I was a big peewee fan and loved it at first. In my room I had bunk beds, and I slept on the bottom bunk. And in the top bunk I kept all of my favourite toys and stuffed animals. I'd often leave them in really weird formations after having battles and the like. But I always remembered to leave certain ones in certain places because they were my favourites. Namely my Ninja Turtles and peewee. A few months after getting this toy though, I started to have some really terrible nightmares about it. Not the, are you afraid of the dark kind of 90s nightmares for kids, but truly graphic and horrible dreams where someone had broken into our house and made me watch him torture my sisters and my parents while the doll just laughed. You know, scarring stuff. So I told my parents and they immediately got rid of it. This apparently just meant they hid it in the garage since I couldn't see the stuff stored up that high anyway. A few weeks later, I woke up to all my Ninja Turtles on the floor. Confused, but maybe I shook the better bunch in my sleep. And a few days after this, my older sister woke my parents up screaming about a dream she had. It was nearly identical to the dream I'd had told them about, but I knew she'd never heard it. My parents knew this too, and my mother looked genuinely horrified. I got screamed at for telling my sister about such horrible things, but once it became clear that I really hadn't told her, my mum got even more concerned. I watched her go into the garage, grab Pee-wee, put him in a trash bag, and put him in the dumpster. For years, I'd wake up and my stuffed animals would be in really odd places, in places I knew I hadn't left them, 
in places I would never have left them. I was obsessed. When I was 12, I found Pee Wee in a toy box in the garage. My mum said my dad must have come home, seen it in the trash and pulled it out. But he doesn't remember ever doing that. He swears he didn't even know she threw it away, let alone try to pull it out. I'm 14 and my brother 18. I was on my PS4 with my good friend playing on one of our games, when suddenly out of nowhere I hear this loud scratching and shaking coming from my bed on the other side of the room. I look over and see my mini football goals that are folded up moving side to side violently, as if someone was trying to throw them around. Both my brother and I saw it with our own two eyes. It happened for a good 10 seconds just randomly shaking violently and didn't calm down one bit and kept moving at the same speed, shaking, constantly. The goals didn't just slow and slow down and stop. No, it was extremely fast and then it stopped after about 10 seconds completely. So after my mini mental panic attack, I started shouting at my brother who had just witnessed the same thing. What is that? How is it happening? And he faces me and starts shouting the same thing I said back. We live near train tracks and they are decently far away, but they're very active, but this hasn't happened in the past seven years. We usually hear the trains driving since it's decently loud. And imagine, if a freight train or something exceptional had come by, surely the goalposts wouldn't have been the only thing that had shaken, right? We then decide to experiment and try to simulate what had happened. So we push the goals to side to side and it only took one second to show that it was very slow and not violent. And let me tell you at this point, I was considering smashing every mirror in the house. Since our mirrors are second hand, they seemed very old. We've had past experiences where we saw tall skinny men in the darkest dark corners of the hallway at night, slowly and carefully bend the door handle and close our door quietly. I cried after seeing this because the arm frightened me more than you know. I'd never witnessed anything so creepy. After this little incident, we checked the house and didn't find any intruders or anything. So there's no way they could have exited the house. This only means that it must have been some entity doing this. I'm positive that it's the same entity that is messing with us and that did the little goalpost fiasco. We were seriously spooked. I'm moving to another country soon, so I'm not that bothered. I just hope I don't have any more repeat encounters until then. A month after my grandfather passed away, sometime in April, my husband and I moved to a house that was built in 1930. It was previously owned by an elderly man who in his prime loved his yard and took care of the landscaping. My grandfather in his prime, as well as an award for winning master gardener, had an award for winning roses of all types. He had taught me a few things here and there, and because of him, I enjoy working in the yard and making it beautiful. When my husband and I moved into his house, the flowers, grass, bushes and roses were in terrible shape. In front of the walkway leading to the front door connecting to the sidewalk was a trellis with climbing roses covering it. It had potential to be beautiful, but not taken care of in years. I didn't think it would have a chance to look beautiful again. I was determined to fix it. I read books, looked online, etc. And finally, one night I had a dream. My grandfather was at my new house teaching me about each type of flower and bush, telling me exactly how to bring the garden back to life, where to clip, where to add plant food, everything. Then we got to the roses and the trellis. He showed me exactly what to do to make it grow, make the roses climb higher, and where to tie the stems to train the vines to grow, how I wanted them. The most important instruction he gave me and told me over and over was to wait until it had rained for two straight days. The next morning I woke up happy because I had felt like I had just spent the whole day with my grandpa who I missed so much. Two days after, it straight rained, and I did everything word for word that he told me, 
and my yard was beautiful. People would tell me they purposefully walked by my yard because it looked so nice. Thanks to my grandfather, he helped a sad yard look beautiful again and taught me more about the plants and flowers than I ever expected to know. I moved into a new house over the winter, my first actual house I've owned on my own, so I was pretty stoked. And we had just had our second kid just a week before signing, so we were excited to get her room remodeled for her. Walls painted, floors redone, making this house ours. Of course, we set up the baby monitor first thing. At first, there were no issues. The baby didn't enjoy the room during the day. She'd stare at the walls as if she didn't like the pale purple paint. We painted them a nice orange that weekend. We also got a cat. And that's when things started getting weird. Bear in mind, the children's rooms are on the opposite end of the house. The cat and baby now had no problem with the room in the day. Our daughter was too young to do much other than be calm or fuss, but the cat was old enough to be a bit more expressive. All day she'd stare at the southeastern corner of the room. At night, she'd arch her back and hiss as if threatened. We'd start hearing faint noises like talking over the monitor at night, but never loud or clear enough to make out. I am nothing if not a logical man. That corner had an old dresser that was rescued from an old army hotel when it closed. Perhaps the cat could sense something or smell something it didn't like. There was also the entrance to the crawl space under that corner on the outside. So a lot of wires entered through there. Both children and small animals are sensitive to electromagnetic radiation. So I went under the house and removed about a hundred feet of extraneous wiring from two previous owners of satellite TV and rewired that section of the house to eliminate possible interference and replace old wires with shielded cable. We also moved the dresser just in case. But the noises didn't stop. They grew more frequent. The cat refused to go into the room during the day. It would sit awake in the crib all night body between the baby and the rest of the room, eyes locked to that corner, occasionally growling or hissing. We stopped letting our son have his radio on at night, in case we were hearing that. As we met our neighbours, we would ask if they had any small children, but none had baby monitors of their own. We installed an alarm system, and I took to keeping my favourite rifle loaded by the bed. Occasionally, the alarm would claim our daughter's window would open, but no alarm would sound, and we'd find it secure when we checked. We ran out of explanations, and began letting our daughter sleep with us, so that she could get her rest. For lack of a better option, I continued the renovation. We finished the bathroom, started on the other rooms, but didn't do any more in the nursery. Out of morbid curiosity, we left the baby monitor on one night. The noises still happened, but the room was being unused. They sounded almost sad. After a week or so without any use of the room whatsoever, I was lying awake after a very long day at work, watching an episode of Bones, when out of nowhere, as clear as day, I hear a woman's voice come over the monitor and calmly saying, it's okay, I'm leaving now. The monitor clicked off, and we've had no problems since. I talked to my wife about it, and we recalled one phrase the owners said during the closing. They had their third kid, and the house wasn't big enough anymore. We had noticed a fair amount of construction material they left behind. Well, we thought they had an addition. She said, looking at her husband, but then, there was that thing, and they never made much eye contact after that. In 2006, before I set out for college, a group of close friends and I would get together at a local church in our small Texas town every Monday to play Halo 2. On Mondays, the Assembly of God would hold a youth day, 
and afterwards we would have permission to use the area to play our game. My friend Daniel was part of the church, so he had keys to the building, hence the special treatment. Our games would go on until about 3am, filled with pizza, music and fun. It was a group of about eight guys and one girl in a very quiet town. Good times. So on particular Monday, we had our setup in the gym, which was across from the parking lot to the church building. After a few rounds, I was chilling with my friends, Weston and Cynthia on my car chatting away. I don't know why, but something urged me to face the church, which was on my right. As soon as I turned, I saw a blue light above the building and spotted what looked like a bright blue flare with a tail zigzagging downwards towards the church roof. My immediate reaction was a fairy, Legend of Zelda influence. Just as I was about to comment, Cynthia blurted out, did you see that? She had spotted it too. We both immediately set up and talked about it. Much to Weston's confusion, knowing on the opposite side of the church from us was a ladder that led to the roof, I suggested we try and climb it to see if whatever we saw landed. As we reached the other side, we saw the ladder was locked up. Cynthia then got a phone call from her brother Jesse asking where we were. We told him about the light and that we were on the other side of the building. Being around 2 a.m., he told Cynthia that it was time they head back home. So we made our way back. Upon coming to the parking lot, just as we cleared a wall, Jesse was coming out of the church building. Remember this part. In excitement, we began telling him about our blue light. Since everything was winding down, the group all came out of the gym to meet with us. We then told everyone about our experience. Jesse then excitedly told us that when he exited the gym to come find us, he saw a blue light inside the church through a window on the side door. Thinking it was my flashlight I had on my keychain, he proceeded to walk inside to get his sister. Of course, when he realized no one was inside and made his phone call, he had also spotted our blue light. Now it was a big deal. Just as he was finishing his story, one friend said, wait, you went inside the church? Everyone froze. You see, it was 2 a.m. Our game was in the gym, separate from the church. The place should have been locked up. Sure enough, we checked the door and it was unlocked. Each person quietly crept into the church to investigate, and upon investigation, we discovered that every single door in the building was unlocked, all of them. This sent chills down my spine. After securing the doors, Daniel called the youth minister to tell him about the ordeal. He gave a semi chuckle, but in reality, we were all freaked out by our blue light. What was it? Did I really see it? Did Jesse really see the same thing I did? Why was everything unlocked after that? Our Monday Halo night groups slowed down after then. We never felt that easy. And to this day, I never knew what I saw, but I can't shake the feeling that something was off about that night. I've had a painting follow me for the past 13 years. I and my first boyfriend found it in an old house that we were helping my sister tear down for a friend. I'm pretty sure it's actually a print or copy. It's not all that interesting, honestly. It's just kind of pale colored print of a little girl seen from behind standing in a field. The only thing about it is that I and a few other people have said that if you stare at it for more than a few seconds, it makes you feel uncomfortable. It doesn't happen to everyone, just some people. For me specifically, there's kind of a blank space in the center that seems like there's something there that you simply aren't seeing. I don't know why. It's just a basic background, but that's how it's always made me feel. So it started with this simple fact that I don't remember bringing the painting home with us. And yet, when we went to pack up and move a few months later, it was in our stuff. Not just lying out somewhere, but actually behind other things. I'm kind of forgetful. So I figured I just grabbed it and forgot. I do remember setting it aside because my boyfriend didn't want it and I didn't care, so I left it behind. Well, a month after we move into our new home, I find it tucked behind some random things. Again, 
I kind of thought maybe someone helping us pack grabbed it or something so it's not a big deal. At this point, we kind of have a joke about it following us but didn't think anything of it. We just left it lying around. That relationship ended very badly and I was left homeless, sleeping on friends' couches. My ex gave me my stuff that equaled out about three boxes, and that was it. They were not large boxes. I went through them several times, and I knew the print wasn't in any of them. I was couch hopping for about a year and never saw the print. I met my now husband and we moved in together. Several months after we had unpacked everything, and digging through a closet, and guess what I find tucked behind some random junk? The print. I told my husband this story and we again joked about it, but this time we put it on a shelf. We've moved twice more since then and each time it's come with us. I don't remember ever specifically packing it, but it's always been somewhere in our things. I always put it somewhere out the way, because like I said, it makes me feel a bit strange looking at it for too long. I have been thinking about getting it framed, as I've never done anything with it. I've just accepted that it's apparently going to be with me until it decides not to be anymore. It's never been good or bad as far as I can tell. Just following. My best friend's aunt died under some fairly mysterious circumstances when we were younger. It took several days for anyone to realize they hadn't heard from her, so her body was left in her house for several days. Fast forward to when I was 15 and she was 17. It was late one night in the summer, and we were hanging out at his house. The three of us, myself, my brother and our friend, were discussing the paranormal and similar themes. Brian told us about he was convinced it was all real because of some stuff he saw happening in his aunt's house a few years earlier. He convinced us to ride down to her old house and check it out, to see if anything creepy had happened. 45 minutes later, we arrived at the house. It's been nearly 10 years since anyone has lived there, so everything is choked out by weeds and tall grass. Brian grabs a bag of flashlights and a video camera, and we walk onto the front porch at this point, my brother loses his nerve and goes back to the car. Brian continues, as do I, towards the front door, and I feel it. A cold, freezing, heavy presence in front of the door, even though it was summer in North Carolina at night and still pushing past 90 degrees. I had goosebumps all over my body, and it took some coercing on Brian's part but I went inside the house with him. We immediately turn on all the flashlights and he fires up the video camera. He's telling me the story of how he and his dad stayed there for a few weeks after his parents got divorced and I start to lose my cool. The biggest part of the story was how he woke up in the middle of the night to see a tall silhouette standing in his doorway. Thinking it was his dad, he didn't mind. Then the silhouette turned to leave. He rolls over to go back to sleep but instead he decides to get up and grab a glass of water. He walks down the hall and sees the silhouette heading into the dad's room. Young Brian decides to follow it, still thinking it's his dad. Instead, he reaches the door to see the shape pressing a pillow over his dad's face, trying to smother him. He yells and turns the light on and the shape disappears. So at this point, I'm already pretty convinced there's something there, but we press on and Brian sits down at the kitchen table. He asks his aunt Linda to let him know if she's still here, and we wait, maybe 30 seconds, and one of the cabinet doors slowly opens. Unconvinced, Brian asks her again to tell him if she's here. The hall closet door slams open, as do two more kitchen cabinets. I'm finally done. I grab my flashlight to go, and the storm door out the front of the house slams shut and my flashlight went out. And that night, I decided there was definitely some truth to it. So one night, maybe a month ago, I'm sitting in my bed scrolling through Reddit or something when I hear my daughter babbling to herself. 
Now it's really late, like one or two in the morning, much later than she ever wakes up, unless something is wrong and she is sick or cutting a tooth or something. So I turn the picture on the monitor on and see her standing up in her crib, facing sort of diagonally away from the camera. I can see her hands in front of her, but only half her face. Now is a good time to mention we have been teaching her ASL since she's about three months old, and she's been responding and conversing in sign since about 10 months. I can see her signing things like nice and silly and fun, and oddly enough, no, I don't like and bear. Of course, being the very good and loving mother I am, and really not wanting to deal with an overly sleepy baby in the morning, I get up to see what the heck she's doing. When I get to her room, she's still standing up and signing and babbling towards the far corner of the room. I ask her what she's doing and who she's talking to, and she signs saying, as best she can, friend, which she does with her whole hand and not just her index finger and signs bear again. I tell her no, see Bear, who is actually one of her stuffed toys, is in bed behind her, not in the corner of the room. But she giggles at me and says, silly, and mummy. I can see she's wide awake, so I sit down in the rocker next to her bed and try to figure out what woke her up. But all she will tell me is friend and bear, and occasionally duck down like she's hiding and making shh noises. I finally get fed up and ask her who friend bear is and her response literally gave me chills because she does not speak well yet but managed to say very clearly and with the most serious face a 20 month old can pull off no name no name Shh. well now i am well and truly freaked out so I tell her to ask no name friend bear to go home because it's too late to play. And I did what any good loving mother would do. I gave her a pacifier, went back to my room, turned off the monitor entirely and hid under the covers in my room where a good loving husband would protect me from nameless invisible bears. I was on a break from college and my parents decided to leave me alone for a weekend to go boating. My grandmother had passed about a year or two earlier, and my parents took their dog, so I was really alone. Besides living in the dorm, I'd never spent a night without my grandmother next door or a dog in the house. I thought I'd be fine. I had my aunt's phone number and was a big girl. Time to woman up. Everything went swimmingly. I didn't have to care for any animals, and I'd spent the previous night with no problems. That day, I'd watched movies, played music, and even eaten pizza in my bubble bath. Don't knock it till you try it. I settled into my old bed, ready to sleep on a nice mattress instead of a lumpy dorm one, but I couldn't sleep at all. At the time, I didn't know what anxiety was, or that I was having a panic attack. I was terrified to move, and every tiny noise of the house was setting me off, and I told myself I was being stupid, and that I'd just go out for a smoke and I would be fine. By the time I lit my cigarette, I was a trembling, sniffling mess. It was too late at night to call anyone, and I looked out and saw my grandma's vacant house and remembered what she told me when my grandpa died, that I could still talk to my deceased loved ones and that they would hear me and protect me. So I spoke to her, sobbing about how I was scared and didn't know why, and no one was awake to help me. The first thing that hit me was her smell. She always baked cookies and froze them, so on any given day there was a hint of flour. She also did not use deodorant. Mum says deodorant wasn't a thing for poor families during the Great Depression, but would use a particular fragrance powder. So it was a mix of sweat, flour and powder. The second thing I noticed was a warm pressure on my shoulders, as if she were behind me, placing her hands on my shoulders to steady me as I cried. My cigarette was forgotten, and all the fear and anxiety vanished. I was almost instantly calm and sleepy. Her smell and presence followed me when I went back inside and lay down in bed. I'd never fallen asleep so quickly, or slept so peacefully in my life. I believe she stayed with me for the night, just like she had done so many times before. The next morning, her presence was gone, 
But the smell lingered until my parents returned. She was right. She did protect me from the panic episode of being all alone in my parents' country house. She heard me and came back to give me peace. I know my grandparents will always answer me whenever I need them. I'm still their granddaughter, and they will always love me, even across the plains of life. I didn't believe in the paranormal until after my mother died. I was with her every single day the last two years of her life as the cancer took over. We shared so much joy and laughter, even though we knew she was going to die. This allowed us to talk about death a whole lot. I asked her to let me know when she was in heaven and still around. I just didn't think it would really happen. The first thing that happened was electrical. I had an iPhone that bricked back in October. I took it to Apple twice and they told me it was no good. I was mad because I've had iPhones since they were released and never had one completely brick. I was also really upset because it had videos from my mom's birthday and our family vacation. I didn't put it on the cloud and regretted it now more than ever. So I tossed the phone in my desk drawer and bought a new one. Life went on and I forgot about it. Well, the night of my mum's funeral, I was editing her video to play the next day, and I grew frustrated because I didn't have many good time videos. When about 2 a.m., my phone kept popping up with the little Apple message saying, enter your Apple ID. I kept putting in my ID, and then the pop-up came up again. No lie. I did this about 10 times before it all suddenly hit me. I literally said out loud, there's no way. As I walked into my home office, I pulled open the drawer and sure enough, the dang little phone that bricked seven months ago was now back to life. I swear on everything, I can't make this up. So I was able to get the videos and put them on the cloud and her video was beautiful. And to this day, the old phone still works. That was just the beginning though. I was scared of birds and my mom knew this. My mom died in April. Well, a few weeks later, I refused to get out of bed and this woodpecker started pecking outside my window. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? It drove me crazy because every morning this thing would start early and wouldn't stop. Then on Mother's Day, I kept hearing this knocking sound against my bedroom window. I look out and all of a sudden these little baby birds popped out of the flower pot. I don't like birds, but I could appreciate the fact that they were babies and it was Mother's Day. I can't explain it, but it made my day seeing new life, and I just knew in my heart they were meant for me. But that was just the beginning. Since then, the same grey dove sits outside literally every single time I walk the dog. I have travelled to work and it never fails. I go outside for a run, and it's there. My skeptical self started to think I was hallucinating or perhaps imagining things. So I began taking pictures of the stuff. I see a red cardinal every day too. God is my witness. I've also found 20 feathers since she's died. And guess what color they are? I've only found the white ones. The rest are gray dove feathers. I've also had odd visitors. One Friday, I was at my lowest point. Finances were hard, and I had no desire to keep moving on, and felt like everyone had disappeared now that she was gone. Anyway, the doorbell rang and it was odd because the dogs never barked. When I opened the door, this maternal Hispanic woman was standing there with a man in a suit. The man said, we came to tell you that we're sorry that you lost your mum. The moment he said that sentence, tears came flowing down my face. I can't explain how much I need someone to just acknowledge my pain. He asked if he could pray and explained that the woman didn't speak English. It was the most incredible and surreal moment of my life. Afterwards, they handed me $400 and said that their son owed my dad money and to give it to him. We were really struggling financially, so I knew my dad would be happy. When he got home, I gave him the money and my dad looked at me like I was a ghost. He said, no one owes me any money, and I don't know anyone by that name. 
To this day, we still have no idea who the strangers were, but from that moment on, our healing really started. Sometimes things happen when you just know there is a higher power orchestrating it all. I was so hard-headed, but I could no longer deny all of these occurrences. I also became really at peace and happy, and just got back to my normal self. It really sped up my healing, and I just knew that my mum was at peace and that one day I'd see her again. One other big moment was when I went to Estes Park, Colorado, last month to hike alone. I was waiting for the shuttle, and there was this YMCA camp going on. I'm talking hundreds of kids everywhere, and I was kind of in a daze and staring into space. When this little girl came up to me, she said, God told me to bring you this letter. It was so unexpected. I was kind of like, huh? Then she said, can I read it to you? First, she read a scripture that basically said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Then, the bottom of the note, it said I was loved and that I'm not alone. And now it's time for me to go and live my life. I will never be able to put into words what this moment was like for me and how surreal the entire thing was. No one knew I was in Estes Park and there were literally hundreds of kids everywhere. And this random girl just popped over and happened to give me a note and scripture like that. She was 12 and told me she didn't understand it either. God just told her to write something down and to give it to me. You see, this scripture is about a woman who bled for many years and she touched Jesus and was healed. Why is this significant? Well, before my mum got breast cancer, I had blood cancer, which I battled for many years. Many of my symptoms had returned and this weighed heavily on my heart. The fear of going through this battle all over again, at this time alone, grappled me. That note meant more to me than anything else I've ever received. It gave me the courage to get my cancer scans because I trusted that my faith healed me, whether it be physically or spiritually. I've never felt more at peace than in that moment. Anyway, those are just a few of the 20 more crazy circumstances that have happened in the last few months. Paranormal activity usually gets a bad name, but it's been far from scary for me. I know there are a lot of people on Reddit who don't like any mention of God or stories like mine, but the truth is the truth and they're real. They happen to me. I'm just honored to be experiencing them because I was afraid of death and I miss my mum so much. But these little winks she sends me give me great hope and I'm no longer afraid of death and finishing my life without her. I know life continues on beyond this realm and it gives me peace. I came from ancestors who were believed to have practiced witchcraft a very long time ago. These people called Bobolian are believed to have had supernatural gifts imputed to them back in the day, including the ability to communicate with other entities from other realms. Mind you, this happened before religions were introduced here. However, these gifts, or some people call them a curse, were passed through generations. And although we're not much talked about nowadays, they can still be observed here and within our families. My siblings, of course, were the chosen ones. My earliest encounter with the supernatural could be traced back to when I was living with my grandparents. Since we lived in such a low socioeconomic state, my parents had to burn the midnight oil grinding stones just to provide for us. We then had to be taken care of by our grandparents who built a small hut on their farm to live at. During this one night, I remembered the moon was full and all of us had put ourselves into slumberland. When I was awoken by a loud howling just outside the hut, so I decided to peek through a small slip between the walls. To my surprise, my gaze struck upon a fair glowing white wolf howling at the beautiful full moon. It was relatively bigger than a normal wolf with crimson eyes and its fur was mesmerizing. It appeared to be glowing or at least it was reflecting in the moon's illumination. 
so gracefully. That's when my grandparents woke up and told me to go to sleep. Later, when I asked them what it was, they told me it was the spirit of the jungle. I was very lucky to be able to have seen it. Fast forward to where I am now. My ability to sense and see things other people can't have long been addressed to me. It's already so normal for me to stay in a cemetery alone at night during our All Souls Festival to have the place cleaned. My colleagues are well aware of this too. I remember during this one time when we were at school and the water supply system had broken. There was a small creek located at the hill's foot where we usually go for our bath. It was dusk and we were only accompanied by the light from our torchlight. It was all normal until the day after, during recess time, where we all gathered at the canteen to talk about how we needed the water supply system fixed, so we didn't have to take our bath at the creek again. My colleague was shocked when I asked this one question, if he saw a woman and her child who were at the creek with us last night. To his horror, the canteen lady, a local there, overheard our conversation and began telling us there was a pregnant woman who passed away a long, long time ago right at the river we usually go to. I wasn't amused by this because with a smile, I simply replied to her, well, the child's all grown up now and seems happy with his mother. And I can see their creeped out look as I said those words. Last year, when the pandemic hit as hard news for our country, schools had to be closed for a while. Regardless of this, I had applied for an interview for a new position in my career journey at the beginning of the year. When schools were temporarily opened in August and September, the supervisors from the upper levels decided to conduct my interview at my school. It was Friday, and normally I would drive back with my other colleagues out the jungle to our hometown. But I was so tired from all the interviews and presentations that I chose to stay at the school instead, this time alone. So I have the whole school to inspect just for myself during that weekend. I remembered it was exactly midnight when I was watching television and my stomach suddenly growled for food. So I went to the kitchen and fried myself some chicken drumsticks. And that's when I heard someone knocking on the front door. I brushed it off, not knowing who or what it was. Even though the house was fully lit, I could feel this tremendous dark energy creeping up my surroundings. My vision is still fine, but my feeling was not. It was as if the world was entirely consumed in darkness and nothing could ever be seen or felt. The feeling stayed for a few seconds and mind you, it wasn't terrifying at all. I was not scared, just normal. When I woke up the next day, I was told by one of the villagers that someone had passed away the night before. During the exact same time, I'd heard the knock at the door and this, believe it or not, was not the first time I saw or felt someone announcing their death. We got this old vintage clock a while ago. It's been in storage for over a year. We moved recently and my dad bought the clock and decided to hang it on the wall about a month ago. No one in my family liked the clock but my dad, so we kept it. So two nights ago, I was talking to my dog about going to the bathroom around 11 to 12 at night. As I take him out, I sit down and chill on the sofa. All of a sudden I hear this ticking and my first thought process is, what's making the noise? So I go and investigate. I walk up to the clock and it's moving. It's ticking and moving. And the glass pane that usually covers it is wide open. I know nothing about this clock, so I literally just look at it and go, hmm, that's weird. Go to sleep and don't dream of anything as normal. The next day comes, and later that night, my mum announces that she's going to sage the house. She hasn't done it in a while, but with all the stress and stuff that our family's been going through, we needed it. Before she starts to sage, I suddenly remember about the clock. Oh, mum, by the way, I heard the old clock ticking yesterday. She tells me that it's not possible, that it's a wind-up clock. So I was confused. My little sister who's 10 then hears what I say and comes up to me like, oh, I heard it ticking too. We heard the ticking at different times in the night. So immediately my mom is just, get the clock out of my house. 
and leaves the clock outside in sages. That night, both my parents have nightmares about my younger sister. My mum describes how she's in my little sister's room and there's a round table in it. It has letters as if it's a Ouija board and there's a voice that starts to speak to my mum, telling her, I like it here. Please let me stay. I like your house. Now my mum is very sensitive to presences and stuff. There are times where she grabs things at goodwill and flinches and tells me that whoever had it was bad. She's been in a car my dad bought to resell and literally started to cry and told him she'd never go in it again. When he got the papers for the car, it came with a title and the owner's death certificate. He died in that car. Anyway, my mum has experienced stuff getting out of her house due to the dumbass things my dad buys and brings to them. She begins to pray very strongly and tries to get him out. The thing comes back and once again my mum gets him out, imagining as if she were burning him. The thing returns again and my mum starts praying so hard that she starts to wake up from her dream. It started to try and negotiate with my mum, trying to let itself stay. But my mum said no. My mum has this thing where she imagines a beam of light coming out of the heavens, and that's what happened when her dream ends. When she wakes up, her entire right arm is cold. My dad is now awake because he heard her screaming and chanting, and immediately my mum asks what time it is, and it's 3 a.m. The witching hour, you know. My mum starts to curse and say, damn it, and then tries to go back to sleep. And my dad had woken up and goes to sleep and proceeds to have a nightmare about my sister. So today comes and my dad is going to get rid of the clock. He goes to work, putting it in his van and starts to work on his van, which he's gonna sell in a few hours. The next four to five hours were the most difficult time that he's ever had with the van in a while. He cut his finger, burnt it, and nothing was going well. Eventually his deal happened and everything was all right on his end, but once he had finished with repairing it, he opens the slider door and he forgot he left the clock in the van. That was what was causing so much trouble. So all of that happened today with that clock. And now, just an hour ago, I was telling them again how exactly I came up to the clock and everything and it was just ticking. I saw it tick. The glass pane was wide open. My parents looked at me as if I'd grown two heads. You see, the glass pane was locked with a key that no one has. My dad had been looking for it earlier that week, but no one found it. All three of us go around in a circle asking if one or the other opened it, but none of us did. We never even found the key. So I don't even know what was up with that. There is also no way my little sister could have opened it because she's too short. So in conclusion, we have no idea how this clock somehow opened on its own, not to mention all the weird stuff that happened to our family. As you can imagine, once it was gone and mum saged the house, everything went back to normal. A few years ago, my best friend died. We were on bad terms at the time. I didn't realize it at the time, but his disease had taken his mind. Apparently on his deathbed, he was hallucinating and laughing and talking to me like I was in the room. About a year later, I had a dream he called me on the phone. It was so realistic. We were catching up on my past year and joking around. And I suddenly realized and asked, Hey, wait, aren't you dead? There was this loud screech on the phone and I woke up. I know I was dreaming, but it felt so real. When I turned 20 years old, I went into my bathroom. It was the middle of the day. I turned to look in the mirror, but felt my reflection turned its back. I was facing the mirror while looking at the back of my head. I was so confused and startled that I left and was afraid to look in the mirror for the remainder of the day. No psych history, no drugs, no alcohol, no explanation. Throughout my lifetime, I have heard three knocks on the door or wall. It's not a common occurrence, usually late at night or early in the morning. I'm wide awake when it happens. When I investigated, I found nothing, no clue. 
When I was in my early twenties, I was trying to sleep on the couch with my girlfriend at her parents' house. I was nowhere near tired. I had my eyes closed and had the overwhelming sensation someone was standing over me. It was intense. I figured it was one of her parents. When I turned my head and opened my eyes, there was this old woman who I'd never seen before. She looked about 80. My heart dropped and the old woman looked shocked as she ducked behind the couch. I sat up and reached over the couch to find nothing. I was camping with a buddy in the high Sierras by a lake. I was trying to sleep on bare ground with my head uphill. It was a bright full moon, so you could see without a flashlight. I had this faint, pulsing sensation starting at my head, moving down to my left and stop at my feet. Now it was intense. I was convinced nothing was there, but would sit up to look and put my mind at ease. I did, and there was a huge mule deer with a giant rack right at my feet. I screamed, and the deer stood on his hind legs and ran off. Freaked me out that something was actually there. Most of the strange things that I have experienced happened in one house in Colorado. First, I kept seeing a dark shadow dart across the ceiling in our living room. That room had a two-story ceiling. I've always had really vivid dreams, and one night dreamt of my husband, but his face was green, gaunt, and skeletal. I knew in the dream that he was close to death. It bothered me so much that I called my brother the next day and shared it with him. About two weeks later, my husband said he had a lump in his armpit, and he showed me a baseball-sized swelling and was diagnosed with lymphoma. While he was being treated for cancer, we had a lot of trouble making ends meet. Discussing finances one night, I said, thank goodness, but we still have the eBay income. A minute later, I went to the study and turned on the computer and it was broken. A tech who came out the next day said the motherboard was absolutely fried and that he'd never seen anything like it. During that same time, I was gathering things together that we no longer needed so that I could sell them on eBay to help our finances. I was again talking to my brother on the phone, telling him about how many great things I had found to sell. One of them was a remote temperature monitor for an infant. I told him it was worth about $150 and I'd never used it. My 10 month old had never been sick. That very night, the baby had a high fever for no apparent reason, and I had to use the temperature monitor. At this point, I was entirely freaked out, and even told my pastor that I felt overheard in our home. I think he thought I was crazy. But in talking to neighbors, they all had stories that were similar. Many were convinced that the houses were built on an Indian burial ground. For my fifth birthday, my uncle caught me. I was only about four years old at the time. I was playing hide and seek with my big sisters. I had thought about hiding in my parents' closet, but decided to hide under their bed instead. I was facing into the room so that I could see when the seeker came in. That's when I saw my middle sister, Betty, come in and hide in the closet. For some reason, the door was already open so she left it that way and hid in the back corner. I was small enough and the bed was high enough off the ground that I could put my chin on my hands and have my head straight rather than having to press an ear to the ground. The counting finished and my eldest sister Nora began her mission seeking. Not even a minute into the search, I'm looking at the closet and my mum still had her wedding dress hanging. I watched as the arms of the dress lifted at the same time, and the dress jerked on its hanger towards Betty. She screamed and went running for our mum, and I wiggled my way out of my hiding place. I found everyone in the kitchen, mum trying to placate my terrified sister, and the other sister with a look of bemused confusion on her face. Betty is trying to tell mum what happened, but can't seem to get the words out. All I can remember her saying was dress, arms. I went over and tugged my mum's shirt to get her attention. Not now, 
she said. But I saw it. That got her attention. Saw what? Your dress. Its arms lifted up by themselves and it moved on the rail. That's why Betty's crying. Mum ushered us all down the room with her, and the dress was in the same place she'd seen at last, hanging limply and forlorn. You must have imagined it, Mum told me. But then why is Betty crying? I ask. Betty was standing in the doorway of the room, refusing to get any closer to the closet. How did you see if you were hiding? Mum inquired. So I wriggled my way back under the bed to show them, and had a very clear view up on the shelf into the closet. What I didn't know was that Betty had also seen a face, as if someone were wearing the dress and trying to reach out to her. There was a psychic living at the top of our street at the same time, so the next day we all trooped off to see her. She told Mum that it was our Nana, her mother who had died the previous year. We didn't believe her though because we'd seen Nan before and she'd never done anything to scare us. We never did find out who or what it really was. Betty still won't talk about it and refuses to acknowledge any paranormal happenings in that house. There are a lot of stories from that house, but nearly 30 years later, Nan still comes to visit. In fact, all my grandparents still visit. I know who it is by the scent. Potpourri for my mother's mum, burnt toast for her dad, tobacco for her dad's dad, and for his mum, her favourite perfume. I was a teen and bought a terrible used car from a guy whose wife up and left him. It was her car, uneventful sale. I drove home and since it was late I went to bed and was going to clean the car and get it all set up in the morning. That night I dreamt that I was holding a baby and I find myself in front of the car guy's house. I knock. He answers the door and I said, I have to give you your baby back and he's really happy and the dream just ends. Okay, weird but my dreams are weird. So in the morning I'm cleaning the car and reach under the seat and find this really pretty brown glass bottle. I can't see what's inside it and the top of it was like a permanent seal. All of a sudden I get this incredible intense overwhelming need to drive to the man's house. Like for some reason I'm having trouble breathing and the tears are just pouring out and I have no idea why. Like I could have just called him but I knew I had to go there right then and there. So I drove there, knock on the door and hand him the bottle and said I found this and I think it's important. He just bursts into tears and told me that these are the ashes of his baby son that died from SIDS a year before. They had split the ashes into two bottles and I guess his ex left them in her car. I know. What the hell, right? I am so, so glad I brought them back. But I never had anything give me chills like this did. I've always been fascinated with haunted items, but never found the courage to buy one until recently. I purchased a haunted doll on eBay. The doll's name was Violet, and she didn't have a crazy backstory. She had long blonde hair and piercing blue eyes. She was the perfect choice, or so I thought. Violet arrived in my mailbox on a rainy Tuesday afternoon. She looked even more beautiful in person than in pictures. I was excited to have her in my possession and eager to see if I would experience anything paranormal. But I had no idea what I had gotten myself into. I sat Violet on my antique dresser in my bedroom and went about my day like normal. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. I went to bed and woke up the next morning. Still nothing. The next night, however, everything changed. I went to bed around my usual time. During the night I heard a loud noise. I live in an apartment, so I figured it was the people above me causing a ruckus. I shut my eyes and drifted back off to sleep. The next morning I woke up and looked directly at Violet. Her legs were crossed. I didn't cross her legs. No one else had been in my apartment to cross her legs. I freaked out and hurried off to work. When I arrived home that evening, I went back into my bedroom to relax. Violet's legs were uncrossed. I hadn't uncrossed them. I had left them crossed and didn't touch her. 
What was happening? How was a doll crossing and uncrossing their legs on its own? Was I losing my mind? I went to bed that night with worry. I was worried about what I would wake up to. Would Violet's legs be in a different position? I awoke that morning to the sound of my alarm buzzing. I immediately looked over to my dresser and Violet wasn't there. I live alone. No one had been in my apartment. Where was Violet? I jumped up out of bed and started looking all around my room. I glanced over to my bed and Violet was there. Violet was laying in my bed staring up at the ceiling. Had she been in my bed all night? How did she get there? I ran out of my bedroom, grabbed my keys and ran outside. I'm currently sitting in a McDonald's parking lot near my apartment complex, typing this. I didn't even want to be sitting in the driveway of my apartment because I'm so freaked out. How did Violet get into my bed? Is she playing games with me? Or am I losing my mind? I'm terrified to go back in there and find Violet, wherever she may be next. I contacted the lady that sold me the doll and she said absolutely no returns. A part of me wants to get rid of her, while another is scared to do so. I don't know what to do. Danny appeared on our neighborhood street on November 2010. I was 10 years old, my brother was eight, and my other two friends were nine and 12. We were riding our bikes up and down the street enjoying our last minutes of daylight when we spotted what appeared to be a black cloaked figure pacing back and forth across the road. At first it was hunched over and we thought it was an animal, but you could tell it was wearing a cloak by the way the fabric moved as it walked. We watched as a car passed by it. As soon as the car headlights touched it, the figure sprang to the side of the road and sat there in the darkness, stooping low to the ground, then resumed its pacing when the car was gone. We were both frightened and curious. I ran to tell my mum about the mysterious stranger and she came out and looked down the road and told me she didn't see anything. This only made us more determined to find out what was going on. We hopped on our bikes and went to check it out. Kaylee, the oldest, went first, with us younger kids trailing behind her just in case it would start chasing us. I don't remember my thoughts as we approached it. I was more fascinated than scared. I didn't believe in ghosts and was counting on my older friend to protect us. When we were about five feet from it, we stopped. By now it had paused its relentless pacing and was standing silently in the middle of the road, watching us. It was a man, about five foot five dressed in a floor length black coat with a hood. The sleeves of the cloak were long and hid his hands and his face was hidden in the darkness of the hood. He looked like the grim reaper without a scythe. At first, the thought crossed my mind that he was one of the neighbors. Halloween had been about a month ago, and what neighbor would be outside on a chilly November evening pacing across the road? And besides, there was something off about the man that you couldn't place, something inhuman. He wasn't see-through like you would think a ghost would be. He was solid and appeared almost as real as a person, except there was something about the way he stood silently in the road staring at us something in the way he moved that made it obvious that he wasn't a part of this world. Kaylee stepped forward. Who are you? She asked. The man did not reply, but his head shifted towards her slightly, and it was obvious he was aware of us. Then his whole body shifted, as if he were going to walk forwards, and Kaylee turned her bike around, screamed at us to run, and began pedaling away at top speed. I instantly fled back up the street towards home, too scared to notice if it was chasing us. Kaylee was a rational kid for her age. She never got scared of anything, but as she ran past me, I saw her look back at the man, and she had an expression of terror on her face. Once we reached home, we looked back to see if he had followed us, but it had vanished. We didn't go back outside that night and walked each other home. Years later, there are so many unanswered questions that me and my friends still discuss. Who was he? 
Where had he come from? Our neighbourhood was surrounded by a forest and a metal fence, and there was only one entrance, and we had been playing in the street all day and hadn't seen any strangers pass through. Why wasn't my mum able to see it? We have nicknamed the encounter Danny, because when we talked about the incident, people think we're crazy if we say ghost or shadow man. Indeed, if I say myself had seen Danny alone, I would have written it off as my imagination. But the fact that three other people saw it at the same time, including Kaylee, who used to make fun of people who believed in the paranormal, is proof to me that we didn't make it up. At night, the memory of Danny and his cloak makes me shiver, and I lie awake thinking about how I'm probably one of the only people on the planet who knew 100% the supernatural is real because we stood in front of it and spoke to something that was not only present in our reality, but aware of us. I wish I had taken some proof, but it was 2010 and we were kids and didn't have cameras or iPhones. I'm not even sure if other people saw it. No other neighbors reported anything strange and my mother still claims to this day that she saw nothing when she looked down that road. I have two other theories that Danny might have been the angel of death, walking amongst the earth to claim lost souls, or perhaps a lost soul himself. Our neighborhood, Long Branch, had been lawless up until 1918, and was famous for its cults and shady encounters, especially in the 70s, when people were in trouble with the law often, and lived there in secrecy and isolation. After we saw Danny, a neighbor ended his life, and his body wasn't discovered until a week later, and another was brutally beaten and ended with a chair while he lay in a coma at a hospital bed. My guess is that someone messed with something they didn't understand, and as a result, Danny was left to wander the dark woods forever, cursing the neighborhood with his presence. We haven't seen him since, although odd deaths continue to plague our old neighborhood. For me, the supernatural is too real and too close, and not something that I ever want to experience again. This experience happened about a month or two ago. My family and I live in a one bedroom apartment and some of us sleep in the living room. I always work graveyard shift at a hotel from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. We had one of those cabinet mirrors that are not permanently attached, roughly four by four, so it can easily be pulled up and moved elsewhere. Usually, it's best done with two people. Now for the experience. On a regular night, I was getting ready to head to work. I leave and everyone in the house is asleep. It's a school day, so most of them are asleep by 11. FYI, everyone in the house is female and leaving me the only male. I head to work and come back in the morning. I go to my bedroom and notice the big mirror leaning against the wall. I found it a bit strange, but figured maybe my sisters wanted to move it so that they could use it to get ready, which would have been the first time them doing so if this were the case. So I asked one of my sisters who was the only one getting ready, everyone else was still asleep, why she moved it. And she replied almost immediately saying, I thought you moved it. I responded by saying, why would I move it? I just got here. She gave me a confused look. I then go to wake up my mum and other sister and they both said that they had nothing to do with moving the mirror. So now I'm stuck. Who the hell moved the mirror? Factors to keep in mind. Everyone in the house was asleep, so no one is honestly capable of moving the mirror on their own but me. Everyone was in the living room at the time this happened and the mirror was in the living room too. If someone physically moved it, how did they do it by not waking anyone up? There were all kinds of things in front of the mirror, makeup boxes, and not to mention a vase that was almost as large as the mirror itself. All of the stuff in front of it was still there and they weren't even moved after finding the mirror in the room. So how did this person move it without moving the stuff that was in front of it? The walkway towards the bedroom is a bit crowded too, because we have this couch bed that pulls out, taking up most of the space. So you really have to squeeze through to get by. At this point, 
I really don't know who moved the mirror because I truly believe that none of my family members moved it. There were only three people inside the house at the time, and I'm sure they had nothing to do with it. Possible scenarios? Someone came inside the house just to move the mirror? Obviously very unlikely, because one, doors were locked and everyone in the house would have woken up to the sound of a door being opened. Plus, whoever this person was would have to have moved all the stuff in front of it too, which would have made a hell of a lot of noise. Or alternatively, something paranormal. And I honestly think that's what happened here. Like it literally moved or floated from the living room to my bedroom with no explanation at all. No one moved it. How did it happen? It really blows my mind. My sister has also seen a female in all white in the mirror while she was doing her makeup. This was on a day she was home alone. There are a handful of unexpected things that happen in our apartment, and sometimes it feels a bit uneasy, or the feeling that something is there. I don't know if it's just me being paranoid, but I do feel that way sometimes. Perhaps it's attached to the mirror. I used to work late at night and be driving home when nearly no one was even awake in my town. You could drive for 10 minutes or more and not see another car nor person. But for whatever reason, driving home at night, I'd always see this guy wearing a hoodie on the side of the road as I drove home. He wouldn't be moving, just standing still as I drove past. I tended to see him in the same places, so I figured he had a similar schedule to mine. Never saw his face but it really was none of my business anyway, so I paid it no mind. That was until a day in early January around four years ago. I was coming home extra late from work after having spent a while after my shift talking to work friends. I got home, parked and walked through my front door. As I was unlocking the door, I felt this compulsion to turn around, that feeling you get when something is watching you. I turned after unlocking the door to see the sky standing on the opposite side of the street from my house, watching me. Same hoodie he always wore, hands in his hoodie pockets like he always stood, and just staring at me. This was the first time I ever got a good look at his face, and despite the barely existing light put out by my home lights and street lights, I could see him clear as if it were midday. He looked like me, but not quite. I've always been on the heavier side, but this guy looked like he'd been starved for weeks, just skin and bone. I stared at him for 10 seconds or more, and then turned to step into my house. When I walked inside, however, the temperature of my house felt like I was inside an oven. It was hot as hell, to the point I almost had trouble breathing from the heat. I looked at the thermometer, but it only read 71 degrees. I heard it was odd, so I looked at my phone again, and to my shock, it read 1.30 a.m. I had checked my phone as I walked up the three stairs onto my porch, and it had only been 12.40 or so. Despite only feeling like I had stared back at the guy across the street for only a few seconds, nearly 45 minutes or more had passed. Sure enough, the house wasn't hot inside. My skin was ice cold from standing in 10 degree weather for nearly an hour. And that was the day I first met my doppelganger proper. I don't really remember how many times I've seen him before then, standing on the side of the road as I passed, but that was the first time I really got a chance to see him. A lot has happened between the two of us since then. I've only ever seen him late at night, and only if I'm completely alone. I used to go on a lot of late night walks with a buddy of mine in the summer, since he works even later than I did, so whenever I'd be walking towards his house to meet up with him, or walking home afterwards, my copycat would sort of follow. He never moved, he always stood in the exact same stance and just stared at me. But if I looked at him, then walked another 20 feet, then looked back, he'd be 20 feet closer, despite never seeing him move. As for the intensity, I can't say it ever really got more intense than that, except for the time I actually tried talking to him, and the time I got to test my phone on him. See, he never really scared me, even when I first saw his face while standing on the porch, it didn't scare me to see that he looked just like me. On the contrary, seeing him usually was very comforting, for reasons I can only assume have to do with our conversation. Since he never really frightened me, I figured I'd experiment with it a bit to see what I could learn about him. One night after a walk, I went to enter my house and saw him standing at the edge of my driveway. I usually don't bring anything but keys with me, 
when I go for a walk, but this night I happened to have my phone too. So out of curiosity, I pulled out my phone camera and held it up to his direction. Sure enough, I could see him through the phone too, so I snapped a pic and went inside. Since my buddy was still awake, I sent him the picture and asked what he could see in the photo. He couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. And when I explained to him that my photo had the doppelganger in it, my buddy saved the photo I sent him and sent the exact same photo straight back. But when it arrived to my phone, it appeared the doppelganger was gone. I could literally scroll up and see what I sent him and back down to his version, and the doppelganger would appear in mine but not his. It was very weird, but it didn't bother me too much. The next day when my buddy went to work, he explained the situation to a friend of his who was big into druidic stuff and has Native American background, going so far as to show him the two pics. The dude flipped his mind and yelled at my buddy to delete the pictures right there and then and told me to do the same. So naturally I did, figuring he knew something I didn't. Last thing I heard from the buddy at my guy's work was that he was working on some sort of charm or something to give me but apparently he left the job a week or so later and never contacted my buddy again. I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts where the term Minutemen was coined during the Revolutionary War. So there's definitely a lot of history there. My mum and I moved into an apartment complex when I was three and we're both really excited to have our own little space. I'm 35 now and can remember all of this so vividly like it was yesterday. I remember having problems sleeping immediately after we moved in. I developed night terrors and would wake up in the middle of the night at the exact same time, 3 a.m., experiencing utter terror. I was so young that I couldn't rationalize what was going on and would scream for my mother to come get me and take me to her room. Every night at the same time this happened, It'd be like I was woken up out of a sound sleep because of sheer terror and just had to get out of that room. And this continued for the next two years. At this point, I'm five. This one particular night, I was laying in bed and woke up at 3 a.m. So I'm just laying there, but this time I'm not screaming for my mother. I'm laying there waiting as if something is going to happen. I can sense it. When all of a sudden, in the pure silence of the night, I heard the doorknob turn and the door to my room open and something just glided extremely slowly across the carpet. Something in my gut told me not to look. I knew if I looked, whatever I saw looking back at me would ruin me forever. So I just laid there quietly staring at the wall while avoiding looking at the door. All of a sudden, the door slams shut and I lay there in fear, but eventually fall asleep after rocking myself to sleep. When I woke up that morning, I immediately asked my mother if she went to check on me last night. And she said no, because she had been asleep herself. The look of terror on my face must have been one for the books because someone or something definitely opened my door last night. I was awake. I know I was. I heard the door open and physically felt someone standing there looking at me. If it wasn't my mum, then who the hell was it? It was just the two of us living there. So I tried to forget this experience and move on with my life. Now, my mum loved having fish tanks, all the varieties of fish, since we weren't allowed to have any other pets where we lived. The fish would just keep dying. I know fish die, and it could be a total coincidence, but my mum knew how to take care of them, and it was just odd how frequently it was happening. We came home one day and all of them were dead, all of them. My mum just shrugged and said she had no idea what happened and chalked it off to bacteria or something in the water. That isn't what I think. I went to bed that night and woke up at 3 a.m. I groggily looked over to my closet, which was directly across from my bed and saw through the darkness, a huge black mass or shadow hovering over the closet. This thing was massive and was the blackest black I've ever seen to this day. I was paralyzed with fear and screamed for my mother who rushed to see what was wrong. And to my horror, she saw it too. She hurriedly turned the light on and the black mass was still hovering over the closet. Looking back as an adult now, I know how terrified she must have been. She didn't want me to scare and I commend her for this. She just got me in my bed, pulled the covers up, covering us both 
and held me close until we both finally fell asleep. To this day, I have no idea what we saw that night or what was actually happening there. I don't think whatever it was had good intentions for us and we ultimately moved not long after. It frightens me to think that something was actually watching me on those sleepless nights and just preying on my innocence. Unfortunately, my mum isn't here to validate the story anymore, but I did ask her about 10 years ago and she definitely remembered it, but could not explain it. I could tell she was uncomfortable talking about it. I was hoping she said she didn't remember so it could be chalked off to my young, wild imagination. But her confirming that these things actually happen still send chills to my core to this day. Quite a few years back, I had met one of my now really good friends on the internet. I'm in Alabama, and she is from Washington State. During some of the first few months of our friendship, we started discussing paranormal things and whether we believed in them or not. We were young teens around 15 or so. Being that age, we hardly took anything seriously. So we brought up the topic of Robert the Doll, discussed his origins, and then started poking fun at him. We'd made remarks about it being comical, seeing him run around through the windows if you were a neighbor, how scared we'd be even if he were locked in the attic. As I believe, that's where they said he was put at one time. It's been a really long time since I'd actually researched him, but he was a fresh study on my mind at the time, and how his footsteps would have thrown us into sheer panic. However, as teens do, we kept laughing about him and making comments about how we'd stop him if he haunted us and such. All of a sudden, my phone started messing up. We were texting all of this back and forth and my screen started blanking out her texts. Right as I'm typing my text, I tell her I wasn't able to see her messages. A message from her actually comes through saying that her phone was messing up. I can't remember what her phone did, but I do know that we were very frightened and immediately apologized to Robert. It honestly seems crazy. Him being in Florida, and us being in two completely different states. But to this day, and according to her, every six months when I bring it up again, I really feel like Robert didn't take too kindly to our teenage stupidity, and somehow interfered with our phones at the same time as a warning to stop, and we did. One night when I was in middle school, I was the only one awake in my house. It was 2 a.m. and I was in the basement on the computer. All the TVs were off and I had no music or anything playing, so it was dead quiet. All of a sudden, I hear a woman's voice at the top of my stairs by my bedroom door saying, Hello? I thought it was my mum, even though it sounded nothing like her, so I go, Hello? And I hear nothing. So I went upstairs and turned the corner to my stairs to see no one there and everyone was still asleep. Next story. I was visiting my mum's side of the family down in Virginia because my aunt's mother was incredibly sick and about to die. So as awful as it sounds, we basically went down and waited until she passed. It was around 3 a.m. and my cousins and I were playing an old video game when her parents came down and told us the news that her grandmother had passed. So we went up to bed and talked for a bit, but finally turned off the lights and went to bed. But all of a sudden, I felt as if someone was in the room watching us. Out of nowhere, I sat up in bed to see a black shadow standing in the corner of the room waving at me. I stared at it for a good 10 minutes until I woke up, telling my cousin that her grandmother was with us. I don't know how I knew it was her, but I just had this feeling. She told me she felt nothing. It still to this day freaks me the hell out. Throughout my life, I've had my fair share of paranormal or unexplained experiences. I don't speak much about them because the times I did try and tell them to my mother or friends, they all thought I was crazy. This was what happened to me last night. I live in a German town called Flensburg and for the past six months have lived in an apartment alone. 
It's a nice cozy place which basically has no room so far as my bedroom and I can see my front door, living room and kitchen. As always, I went to bed around 10 p.m. And as per usual, I woke up around 2 a.m., opened my eyes, and as I did, the feeling of utter terror overwhelmed me. It was a fear I have never felt before. I turned my head to the right where my front door is, and there I saw a very dense black smoke entering from the keyhole. I was trying to scream for help, even though no one would come, because I knew the smoke had bad intentions, but I couldn't scream at all. As more smoke came from in the keyhole filling the room, the more difficult it became for me to breathe. A feeling of despair and inability to react made my fear of the smoke even greater. I didn't know what exactly it wanted from me. Did it want to kill me? Was it a demon or a ghost? After a time that seemed to be infinite, the smoke morphed into a veil that had kind of a human shape. It was floating in the air as it stretched out its left hand against the wall and started moving towards me, blacking everything in its path. From its bottom side, a dense smoke was coming out, which blackened the floor. Note that street lights are coming into my apartment, so it isn't completely dark, but this entity made every light or object vanish. Then it entered my living room and stood in the middle, as smoke was coming out and consuming everything in darkness. First, my coffee table, then my TV, and finally my sofa. As it did, I completely stopped breathing, and fear consumed every cell of my body. I blinked, and this entity moved from the corner of my living room to the left foot of my bed. It floated in front of me for no more than two meters, when it started to fade away. A second later, before I could even grasp what happened, I noticed the smoke emerging from the floor, covering the bottom of my bed and slowly coming up. First, it covered my feet, at which point I completely lost every moving ability. It slowly moved upwards until my body finally reaching my head and entering my left ear. And then I heard something. You belong to me now. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so very much for listening. Oh, I hope you enjoyed tonight's video. It really was a bit of a pain to um, to get it out because it wouldn't bloody load. So there you go. Um, yeah, I really hope the internet gets restored tomorrow. I'm thinking this week's schedule is probably gonna be Tuesday, if this video gets released. Thursday and Saturday, the usual comp. And then next week we should be back to our regular programming, if all goes well. So there you go. Um, yeah, that's it from me. I am exhausted at this point. Leonora had her first vaccines today. Um, and yeah, she she cried, that made me sad. But then she pretty much fell back asleep straight away, so that's good. And apparently she's growing pretty well and eating well, so that's that's all you can ask for, really. She seems to be really healthy and we're really happy. But yeah, this is me signing off. Huge thanks to all my members patrons and coffee supporters. Remember, if you want to check that out, the link is towards the top of the description. It does say coffee, just under where it says support. For now then, guys, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one. I'm a 17-year-old female, and usually don't experience more than seeing a few shadows, a few sounds in the house here and there, the basic stuff. But I do have one story that I have never been able to explain, and to this day still have no explanation for. Children are way more susceptible to the paranormal than adults are. As a lot of you may know, as a child, I never really had any experiences, nor do I really remember my childhood much in the first place. This one memory stands out the most, yet I don't even remember exactly when it occurred. I don't remember what age I was at the time, but it was during the time I was living with my mum at my Mima's old house, so I must have been about five or six. I think my dad was at work. He worked late nights and usually wasn't home until dawn. I was fast asleep on the couch one night. 
the small 2000s TV was on and was staticky and bright. It was the only light in the room. It was bright enough to light up the rooms connected to the living room as we lived in a small house. I was asleep on the couch and I sensed something was in front of me, which caused me to wake up. When I woke up, I saw one of my toys standing in front of me on the coffee table, just staring at me. It was one of those old Teletubby toys that had buttons on its chest that you could push and it would sing or dance. When I opened my eyes, it opened its eyes. As soon as it opened its eyes, I ran to my mum's room and jumped on the bed. These toys can't walk. But the thing was chasing me. When I got onto the bed, it tried to follow but couldn't. Instead, it crawled under my bed. I just went back to sleep. The next morning, I got up to see if the toy was still under the bed. I couldn't see it but one of my cats, and some wooden boards were stacked underneath. I reached in to pet my cat and he was stiff. I looked at his face and had no idea what happened. My cat had his mouth and eyes wide open in a natural relaxed position, sitting his head up as if he had no time to scream and then he was just frozen in place. The toy was nowhere to be seen. I haven't seen that toy in years. It's a bit ironic considering all the theories about the Teletubbies. A few years after the incident, I told my mum quite a few times, but each time she seemed to not remember, until a few months ago. I mentioned it to her again, but this time got a completely different response. My mother has had the exact same thing happen to her as a child with a glowworm toy. She said that she had evidence though. She wasn't the only one to see it. She had a sibling who was with her at the time that it happened to and her brother had actually been bitten by the thing. It makes me wonder, what would have happened to me if I hadn't have had the instinct to run? I might have ended up like my cat. I still miss him. We all have a strange story. To be honest, I've never been sure if I just have an overactive imagination. Regardless, I've experienced a handful of instances in my life, such as voices, shadows, apparitions, and mild poltergeists, at least, I believe so. This is one of those instances, probably the worst, that always haunted me. As a kid, I would often spend weekends at my grandparents' house. It was a safe place for me. I was a very awkward child without any friends for the longest time, so my grandparents were the sweetest people I'd ever known. They were some of the most important people in my entire life. The house was a large ranch style single level home shaped sort of like a big U. On one side was the main living room, two bedrooms and the main bathroom with the main entryway to the kitchen. To the left of the kitchen was the other half of the house that had a laundry room, a wide hallway and two rooms to the left down a short hallway. And down the wide hallway led to a second living room. The second living room is where I spent most of my time when my grandparents wanted to relax in the main. There was a large TV, a big comfy sofa and a Sega with a bunch of games. Sometimes my Grammy and I would play games like Mortal Kombat, Sonic the Hedgehog, Pitfall or puzzle games until she was tired. Then I would continue to play until I was tired and passed out. And as most gamers know, that sometimes meant all night. However, here lies the problem. The only available bathroom at night was on the opposite side of the house, and to get there I had to go through the wide hallway, which we called the music room. It had a piano, a large stereo, my grandpa's guitar and amplifier, shelves with books of sheet music, and an old antique cabinet. But on one wall, from top to bottom and end to end, mirrors covered every square inch. Not like a bunch of individual mirrors, but hand-cut mirror squares laid together to make one giant at night it was especially terrifying because the hallway always felt infinitely longer than normal. It was almost completely dark, except for the street light that crept through the curtains into the dining room and entryway. My grandparents were rather conservative with their power bill, considering the size of their house, so whenever they went to bed they made sure to shut all the lights off. Even the one in the second living room where I was, 
It didn't bother me since my eyes were glued to the TV anyway. Eventually when I had to pee and couldn't hold it in any longer, I had to be brave. And on one night when I was 10, it was a particularly rainy and stormy night during the winter. Cliche, I know, but anyone who lives in the Pacific Northwest knows what I mean. As usually, all the lights were off and the heavy rain sounded like soft static as it was on the windows. Nature had been calling for a while and I'd been holding it for a lot longer than I should have. A knee shaking trick would no longer work. Why the hell did I insist on drinking so much soda? You'd think after a while I'd have learned not to. So I had a rule when walking down this hallway at night and in retrospect, this wasn't my brightest idea. I always had an interest in many things, horror and the occult, thanks to the crime channel. That being said, the rule was, as long as I could see myself in the mirror, I was safe. No one can sneak up on me. Occasionally, I would run scared because I'd see something or I'd hear a voice. Oftentimes, I'd trip on the landing and wake up grandpa. And yes, I still call him grandpa, even at 33. It makes him upset if I don't. And there is a chance he's gonna be hearing this. But not tonight. Tonight, I would make them proud. I would be brave and walk calmly and face my biggest fear, which wasn't the darkness, but what was in the darkness. So I paused my game, stood up and looked down the hallway. Thankfully, Grammy left the curtains in the kitchen open tonight. She caught on to my fear in the hallway at night. So it was illuminated more than usual by the soft orangish glow from the streetlight. Once my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I turned and looked at the mirror. There I was, the chubby black haired boy. I blinked a few times to confirm as I adjusted my eyes a little more to the dark. I puffed up my chest, stood tall and began walking confidently, yet slowly down the long dark hallway. For a moment, I felt so proud and powerful, so strong. And with each step, I finally felt I was growing up. The darkness was no longer as scary as before. There was nothing in the dark except for me and my reflection. And that's when I felt the legs of my newly acquired pride swept out from under me. Just before you get to the landing at the end of the hallway, across from the mirrors was the other short hallway to my grandparents' room. And across from that was my granny's sewing room. That short hallway was always pitch black and was far more terrifying than the mirror wall. For a brief moment, I mistakenly looked away from my reflection into the abyss of that dark hallway. And I turned back just as I made it to the landing to see my greatest horror. My reflection had stopped before me and I felt my soul sink into a pit of terror. My eyes widened with the feeling of total dread and my jaw dropped. My heart began pounding so hard it felt like it was gonna burst through my chest like from the alien movies. I took a few steps back and my reflection stood still facing towards me in the mirror. Its head tilted to the side with a smile that wasn't mine and its deep lifeless black eyes fixated on me. Its body and shoulders sort of slouched forwards and drooped like a marionette doll waiting for someone to move it. I shook my head to try and wake from what I believed to be an illusion. But now the reflection stood closer to the mirror than I was as if just on the other side of a window. Its head raised, staring with that evil smile and black eyes opened wide as if to steal my very soul. Its rigged movements crunched as my reflection raised its hand and placed it on the mirror. I assumed it wanted me to place my hand in the same spot. Frozen with fear, I didn't move, I couldn't. My brain was screaming to run and my body wouldn't respond like standing sleep paralysis. I wanted to cry or to call for help. I wanted someone to save me. And after a moment, I placed the other hand on the mirror and the smile on my reflection turned to a look of utter rage and malice. Thick black liquid was dripping from its snarling teeth. It opened its mouth to scream, but it was faint like someone screaming in water. Rolling its head around, swaying from side to side, I could see the veins in its neck and face from the pressure. Its open mouth revealed it was full of the black oil-like substance that did not drain down its chin or neck. Then it slammed it shut, clenched its teeth tight and just stared at me. 
It lowered its hands and began to step back towards the dark hallway. Each stiff step clicked and crunched, never breaking eye contact. And it stopped just before it was engulfed in darkness, before it smiled once more. And it mouthed the words, we are one. And then it was yanked off into the abyss, as if its puppet master pulled it through a curtain. Finally, my body began to respond as I ran to the bathroom as quickly as I could, waking my cousins who all fell asleep in the front room with my heavy footsteps, shushing me as I passed by. I stood and quiet as quietly as I could. I was soaked from head to toe with sweat. My body felt overheated and exhausted like I'd run a marathon, and I fight to control my breathing and heart rate. Once I calmed down, I soon realized I hadn't wept myself, though admittedly I was surprised. Being the stupid kid I was, curiosity began to overcome my fear. I needed to know. Was I insane? Was my reflection gone? What kind of monsters really hid in the dark? Not considering the fact I was looking in the bathroom mirror when I had this revelation, I slowly walked back to the hallway, tiptoeing softly. I was shaking with fear, drowning in cold sweat. But my face felt as if it was on fire, fighting back tears. I crept around the corner, catching a glimpse with my peripheral vision and keeping a look on the dark hallway to the left. I moved forward a little until there I was. No black eyes or scary smile, no rigid movements or black liquid on my face, it was just me. I blinked to make sure. The confirmation put me at ease, so I stepped in front of the mirror and told myself it must have been my imagination. However, things seemed different. I didn't recognize my reflection. It didn't seem like my face. I looked left and right and up and down, inspecting my features. This isn't me, I began to cry, and went back to the second living room where I cried myself to sleep. To this day, the face in the mirror has never been the same as the face I see in pictures. The little boy in my family's photo album is not the one I would see in the mirror after that night, or ever again. And after I told my close friends, a Reiki shaman who practices hoodoo and Santeria believes I could be a changeling, or that the reflection I see could be the spirit latched onto me. He's offered to do some rituals, but honestly I'm too scared to try. Being a skeptic, I've always questioned my mind and sanity. I never told anyone this story until my late twenties for fear of judgement. I was always scared to find out if it was true or not. I was scared to know if something in my brain was broken, and I cope with this by just accepting it. I'm now in therapy and considering medication. Maybe I will take my friends up on his offer to try and heal me. But one thing remains the same. My face in pictures still doesn't match the face that I see whenever I look in a mirror. My brother went fishing a while ago with some friends on some native land that they really shouldn't have been on. While fishing, my brother finds a funny shaped rock and he brings it home. Like most people, rocks are rocks and that's just about it. He brings it home and for some reason is fascinated with this rock. I look at it and think it's just a regular rock, but he decides to shine it and leave it on his bathroom window. Nothing happens. But after a few weeks, odd things begin to occur. The soap in his bathroom is always moved. You know, most people leave the soap in the little soap dish, as does he. And then, at random hours, he starts yelling out who's moved his soap and it would be found in the oddest of places. I think the funniest was once in a sock in his drawer. He assumed that one of us was trying to pull a prank on him, but after interrogating the family, I think it was pretty clear that no one could be bothered enough to be hiding his soap. Then it escalated to his keys, his wallet, even his passport went missing for about a month. All in all, he decided that it must have been the rock. I'm unsure, nothing ever happened to me. But he took the rock back to exactly where he found it on his next fishing trip, left it there, and according to him, everything stopped after that. Make of it what you will, 
But my brother's a lot of things, but certainly not a liar. Over the last five years, a lot of things have happened to change my understanding of the paranormal. As a child, I can remember some vague experiences, but dismissed these recollections as merely the product of a childish imagination, spurred on by traumatic experiences of a very abusive and miserable childhood. I have often envied those who describe childhood as a time of innocence, and such, for they are blessed with the ignorance of the world that I was denied. I cannot remember ever feeling safe or even loved. I do, however, remember almost constantly feeling frightened and vulnerable. Maybe this is how my earliest memories are of having several vivid, lucid dreams, wherein I saw my recently deceased Grandfather Jones. I do not remember him as a living person, I know nothing of sitting with him or seeing his face. Even now I do not know what he looked like. I only knew that in these dreams it was him. He was waving to me across a snow-covered landscape. It wasn't cold, but there were no features on the environment except our house and a garden surrounded by a small white picket fence. On the lawn, I was making a snowman. At some point I became aware of my grandfather waving to me from over the fence. He was happy to see me, and before I knew it, he had occupied the snowman. I loved that snowman, and we travelled around together. However, he eventually melted and the dream ended with me feeling sad that he was gone. On another night, I remember seeing the world from his eyes. I knew I was in the hospital briefly surrounded by relatives who were all grieving, and I began to rise up from the bed and float up. Although I could see the people in the room, I remained invisible to them. Then the scene changed, and I was being buried. I was in the coffin and the dirt was being placed on top of me. I could hear and see people crying even though the dirt was covering me. I could still see everyone somehow. I then began to feel my spirit float up and out the grave, I remember feeling like Jesus Christ risen again. I held out my arms for either side of me and gestured warmly and lovingly to all those at the funeral. I wanted to tell them that I was okay and still here, even though I was dead. These were deep concepts for a five-year-old to have. Death, resurrection, the soul. I suppose I must have learnt them from church as I was made to attend regularly. My father would take his life when I was seven, and I would be with my younger sister when we found him by his neck in our bedroom. Our mother had realised that he had probably done this and decided to leave him for someone else to find. She realised that this would be us, but didn't care. Like I said, our childhood was abusive. This was just one of the average sort of things she would do to hurt us emotionally, physically and mentally. Nowadays I call this a narcissistic personality disorder, but it would take years before anyone could dismiss her sadistic tendencies as part of schizophrenia. She herself would always attempt to get sympathy by claiming depression made her do what she did, but she has always gained pleasure from the suffering of others. Most people miss it, as it's typical of narcissists, but I can see it a mile away. I would go to live with my Aunt Maureen and Uncle Stuart. They would raise me, but a year or two later after moving in with them, my uncle developed cancer. He was afraid of hospitals due to extensive surgeries he's received from injuries sustained during the Second World War, and had no pain relief as the cancer ravaged his body before ultimately ending him. Seeing a man go from a strong, powerful human being to a feeble and diseased body is a troubling experience at 10 years old. My Aunt Maureen also lost her closest sister during this time, so she became very depressed. She came to rely on me for constant support. No one else in the family would care for her, and I had to spend my 21st birthday staying and bathing her after one of her many accidents due to being unable to control her bowels or bladder. 
It's difficult when you're the only person who's willing to provide care for someone. But I did it because I loved and still love her without reserve. And I would do it all again. But I do wish I had help as she developed severe dementia and then Alzheimer's. And as her mind turned to mush and she forgot everything in her life. Finally, I had to arrange a nursing home for her as it was impossible to even fetch shopping without her letting herself out. She passed away in the nursing home eight years after going in. My mother had managed to put herself in a position of carer for her. And despite me being her son and Aunt Maureen being my real mother, my biological mother made sure that Aunt Maureen was buried without me being told. The pain of this was indescribable. I cursed my mother for denying me a chance to say goodbye to my much loved Aunt Maureen. I was living and working hundreds of miles away in London when Aunt Maureen passed. I had met my now long-term partner back then. We were dating and getting on very well, and we reached the point where Sandra would stay over with me, and she told me how she was psychic, as her mother was. Many months later, when I found out Aunt Maureen had passed, we were talking, and Sandra brought up an incident whereby she had woken up in the middle of the night to see an elderly lady standing beside the bed looking at me. When she woke, the apparition looked like Sandra, before looking back to me. She had a sad expression on her face, so she hid beneath the covers and despite trying to wake me up without success, she eventually fell back asleep herself. The apparition Sandra described was the exact image of my Aunt Maureen. I never made the link that night, but it was around the time Aunt Maureen passed over. But the thing that clinched it for me was the description of the apparition being exactly like that of my beloved relative. This strange point was that I have no photographs of my Aunt Maureen, not one. I also never told Sandra anything about how my Aunt Maureen looked. Around this time, I would also wake up in the morning with the sensation of someone clutching my ankle gently. My foot would be out of the bed, which always freaks me out, so I never allow my foot to protrude from underneath the covers. Yet this happened two to three times. There was also my nan who I loved dearly. She passed away a few years after Aunt Maureen. This other lady was the other angel in my life. I've had three so far, Aunt Maureen, my nan, and Sandra. The fact that my nan would be sensed around me after she passed, I could sense her hand in the small of my back or nudging me when I was doing something bad. Due to losing them both so quickly, I fell back into my old habits of drug abuse. I started on crack and heroin, intravenous daily, several times daily at one point, and this would sometimes cause horrifying encounters with spirits. One time I was coming up, and I was sensing an angry spirit just around the corner of the door. I said out loud, I think you're in my imagination so I won't let myself be scared of you. With that, I saw my trainer be kicked across the floor, and rolled several times before it finally came to a stop. After another few times with several witnesses, and no windows or doors to cause a draft, I had paperwork go flying up in the air, as though blown by a strong gust. It happened a few weeks in a row, and got to the point where I could tell people, watch what happens when I do this, and it would occur. It always happened, just as I took a hit, and wasn't scary as much as it was intriguing. Even now, when I think about it, I often wonder if I hallucinated it. However, unless you're unable to see straight, you know if you are likely to imagine something. I had one night when I was parked up in a car next to a field, and we were doing our thing, only for me to see some short, dark-coloured imps run from the gate to the field underneath the car. I could see them peeking out at me. Every time I tried to look directly at them, it was as though either they ducked out the way, or something prevented me from doing so. Around this time, the mood of the vehicle grew menacing and dark. We began to argue, and one of the guys in the car said he wanted to take his life. I've done research on this phenomenon since then, and apparently there are fairy or fae who can influence men in such a way. The defining moment for me was when they knocked against the wheel of the car, 
as they were moving. I heard the thud, and asked the other occupants if they had also heard the bang. They all said they had, but didn't understand what it was. These creatures seemed to move incredibly fast, and flicker between locations rather than move as you or I would. I've had them appear in my home, even though I moved many miles away. They sort of look around corners at you, with an almost fun or mischievous intent. However, I don't think they're good for me. On another time, I swear that a spirit appeared at the kitchen door. It was a large French door, fully length, double glazed, and there were no lights on in the kitchen or outside. I was intending to get something from the kitchen, but I could see this shape and it was seriously scaring me. And I huddled on the floor while staring at it. It seemed to push against the glass before I pushed myself backwards enough to get out of the door. This was in Swindon, Wiltshire, an area known for crop circles and UFOs, as well as Stonehenge and Avebury. But there is something otherworldly around this area. I've never seen a ghost, but I've heard them once or twice. One time I was in Bradford City Centre, and there was an abandoned factory or warehouse. I was there with another person, and he asked me, Brace yourself, and do not panic. But do you hear those noises? I explained that indeed I could, but for some reason was not scared of the source of the noise. The sun was setting, and the light shone in sideways through the building. I looked at the source of the footsteps and could make out the faintest blur moving around. It was as though it was hiding from us, and it leapt into a pit in the floor. I could see the shape of the top of the head peeking out from the shadow at us. It was moving very fast, and I was more intrigued in the spirit. I felt a connection to it. It seemed frightened of us. This incident was in the mid-2019s. Another time, a few months later, towards the end of 2019, I was walking up a hill near where I live. There were some old stone steps off to one side, and as I stood waiting for the return of someone else, I could hear footsteps descending, even though I could see no one on the steps. The weather was damp and humid, with no breeze and a very overcast sky. It seems that these incidents have led me to research more of the paranormal. I was fascinated when I was a young man, and read many books like those by Arthur C. Clarke and his peers. But I had never experienced anything when I started my research. Indeed, I would lie awake at night praying for something to show itself. Probably not the wisest move, and maybe it's why I have had experiences later in life. I suspect I was being protected when I was young and foolish. I remember having another dream about an occult lord who would take away my power to experience the paranormal. I accepted because at the time I was seeing strange phantoms at night, walking the house and shared with my family. One of them looked like a cousin from the Adams family, and me and my sister would scream when it looked at us. None of the adults could see it. Of course, they dismissed us as being naughty. The house was 340 years old after all, so, if a place ever would be an ideal home for spirits, this was it. Anyway, thank you for listening to my ramblings. I think this is everything. The only other incident was that my mother was attacked by an occultist when she was a teenager. He performed black magic spells on her and her sister, plus their two friends, and it was a horrible incident. I sometimes wonder if this could have transferred to our lives, as we were her children. It would be nice to know that she wasn't just a sadistic and cruel person, and there is more to this world than any of us can ever know. Since he started walking, I've shared a room with my younger brother. For maybe seven or eight years, we've slept in a bunk bed. Me on the top, and him on the bottom. It's positioned so that one side is against the wall, which I've always slept against. It is extremely difficult to even touch me from there without climbing into the bed, which shakes a lot. Ever since I was young, I've had a fear of the dark, so to this day I sleep with a blanket over my head. A few years ago I was trying to get to sleep, when I felt someone punch me in the throat, except there was no pain. 
It just felt like a powerful force hit me. The bed didn't shake, so no one had climbed the ladder. And I know that you can't punch with that force over the side of the bed. I lifted the cheat from over my head, and there was nothing there. I collect Lego sets, and one of my biggest is a large circular spacecraft that has a large ring on the outside connected to a cockpit in the middle. The cockpit has a handle attached to it that lets you spin it. Whenever it spins over a certain point, it makes a noise. The ship had fallen off the shelf, and the ring had broken apart. So I put all the pieces into a box to keep them together. One night, my brother was at a sleepover, so it was just me in the room, when all of a sudden the spaceship makes a noise. I assumed it was the handle falling over the point where it makes the noise, when the noise repeated, which would require the handle to rotate upwards from where I assume it was. This happened a total of four or five times before it stops. Needless to say, I rebuilt that ship the next day. Around 14 years ago, when I was around 10 and my sister 8, our parents split up, and my mum moved around 20 minutes away from my dad's house. My sister and I lived with my dad most of the time, but would go to my mum's on weekends and sometimes Tuesday nights. I just wanted to state that my dad was a very strong Christian and I was raised with his faith. We'd often discuss angels and demons and the like, and I'd always believed in them strongly and still do. My mum never really identified as religious, however. My mum lived with a lovely lady who was very welcoming, and they lived in a nice modern house with white tiles and marble benches, so it was in no way creepy or seemingly haunted. Despite this, I had a few experiences in this house that I wish to share now. My sister, mum and I all slept in her bedroom. I would sleep in bed with my mum and my sister on a mattress on the floor at least until she made us swap due to my restlessness. One night I woke up for no apparent reason and started looking at the end of the bed where I saw my sister going through my mum's jewellery box. And I started to wonder for a while if it was one of those wakeful dreams or if it was actually my sister. When I was convinced it was actually her, I woke up my mum and told her my sister must be sleepwalking. I thought we might be able to have a bit of a chuckle about it, my mum awoke and told me there was no one there and my sister was still in bed. I was a bit stunned as I was certain I could see her there. The next experience was slightly more unnerving. I don't remember how close to the last experience this occurred, but on another night I awoke and again looked to the end of my bed. This time, instead of my sister, I saw a disheveled looking figure standing there silently facing me. It appeared to be a woman, but I couldn't see a face. The figure wore a tattered white dress or nightgown and had messy black hair. I just laid there and stared. I didn't move or speak. It just faced me silently. I don't remember anything after that, whether it finally vanished or if I pass out. The final experience I had in this house wasn't something I saw, but rather something I felt. I was in bed one night, still sleeping on the floor, and mum was up watching TV across the hall. Quite suddenly, I felt this presence of absolute terror and malice fill the room. I knew without a shadow of a doubt something was in the room with me, and it didn't want to be my friend. Doing what I thought was best, I prayed my hardest, and eventually the feeling subsided. Rarely have I ever felt such an overwhelming negative feeling take hold of me for no reason at all, and then pass again. Except in a couple of sleep paralysis experiences I've had. But that's a story for another time. The paranormal has followed me for my entire life. These events I'm about to share span from when my mum was pregnant with me until I was about eight years old. My parents built a house in Sashi, Texas, when they were first married and had an English bulldog called Muggins. Two years after my parents were married, my mum became pregnant with me. The activity began with their dog, Muggins. Mum was about seven months pregnant with me and wanted to sit in a chair in the living room to watch TV. Muggins was in the chair, and Mum told him to get down, and he would. So she went to push him off the chair, and he growled and snapped at her, and his eyes flashed green. 
not wanting to get attacked by her dog while pregnant with me. She let him have the chair and she sat on the couch. Fast forward another month and my dad was trying to get Muggins to go outside. He refused, turned on my dad, eyes flashing green again and attacked him, but luckily he wasn't hurt. Mum and dad couldn't believe how Muggins had changed. He was such a sweet dog before moving into that house. Mum and dad decided to give him away to an elderly man they knew. They asked the man months later, after I was born, how Muggins was acting. He informed them that he was doing great, an amazing companion, but the activity didn't stop there. My mum and dad were in bed, and my mum woke up my dad, rocking back and forth in bed, shouting, No, stop, get off me. My mum, thinking he was having a nightmare, started shaking his shoulder. Rick, wake up, you're having a nightmare. That didn't work, so she slapped him across the face and before she knew it, something scratched her eye. It couldn't have been my dad, his arms were pinned to his chest and he has very short fingernails. My mum's eye doctor confirmed she had a perfect cut right across her eyeball. Unfortunately, it didn't do any permanent damage. The next event happened one day when my mum was home with me. She went into the kitchen, pulled a glass from the dishwasher, filled it with ice, then some cola, and before she could lift the glass to take a sip from it, the entire rim of it broke off in a perfect circle. Stupid me, she said to herself. The glass must have still been too warm when she lifted it, she thought, and then put ice in it. She threw the glass out for another, and did the same process and the glass did the same thing. Mum at this point knew it wasn't a coincidence, and she yelled out for whatever it was to doing that to stop it. And, as they say, third time's the charm, and she finally got to enjoy an ice cold soda. This last experience was mine. I was about a year old sitting in the living room floor when one night in front of the TV with my mum sitting on the couch behind me and my dad already being in bed the living room was dark the only light was coming from the TV in the corner of the left of the TV I saw a tall shadow figure of a man I couldn't see any facial features but I could tell he was wearing an old-fashioned suit from like the 50s he must have noticed me when I saw him he simply took his hat off tipped it at me and I saw he was bald. I pointed at him and said, Mummy, man! When my mum and I talk about it to this day, she says that she never saw anything and that she is shocked I could remember considering that I was barely one. But she knows I'm not making it up since she remembers that night very well. My parents sold that house not long after. My mum swears it was a demonic presence. Maybe. But who knows? When I was 19 or so, I had moved into my first apartment alone. I got all my furniture from the thrift store next door. They were pretty good finds too. My favorite was a pair of red armchairs that I'd often fall asleep in while reading. One night I woke up and there was a little girl sitting in the chair across from me. The lights were still on as I had fallen asleep reading and I could move around so I knew it wasn't sleep paralysis. She started playing peekaboo, and so I played back. When I removed my hands after the third time, she was gone. I did have sleep paralysis at least three times a week in that apartment, but it was nothing like that night playing peekaboo. Growing up in Folsom was a dream come true for me, in that it was a world away from South Sacramento culturally. No drive-bys, no gangs, no needles in the street or in the parks, and I lived in the old part corner of Natoma and Decur. Dad had a few houses on Natoma, three of which were over a hundred years old. The first house I moved into was a weird one in terms of layout. It was originally built in 1901 or 03 on Mormon Island, and was taken down and rebuilt on higher ground before construction of the dam began. I know this because a few houses down near Reading Street was an 87-year-old lady whose dad was the one that built these houses and would check in on them from time to time. Now I knew the people that lived in that house before I moved in, and when I told them I would be the next tenant, their advice was to keep the house neat and tidy, or I'd piss off old George the ghost. 
I took it to heart, because it's a weird and wide world and I've seen some stuff. Shortly after moving in, one of my friends convinced me to let him be my roommate. In many ways, he was the best and worst roomie. He paid half the rent, but not food or utility because he only wanted a place to step out on his girlfriend and was rarely there. The times he would show up after last call and bring a bunch of people with him, which just became normal. And I got used to putting in earplugs around 2.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning. People would see George plain as day. He wasn't a mist or shadow, wouldn't speak or gesture. He moved like a blink. And when he was around, you could always see him from the corner of your eye. He would do annoying things like dumping soap on dirty dishes or turning on the sink, leaving empty pizza boxes at the foot of my bed for me to step on. Really passive aggressive things just to make a point. People who stayed at the house would just assume he was my grandpa and would ask what he was doing in the house at 4 a.m. It's really unnerving to see an old man in a brown suit doing the dishes while people are hanging out at the bar. He was never violent, never interacted physically with people other than leaving car keys in the toilet or fridge if they'd been drinking and were talking about leaving. He would also find keys and wallets if you asked. If it were important and you set it down in the house and forgot, it would just be on the floor in front of the door or somewhere obvious. Now, getting to the only time he scared me. I was sleeping when I heard people socialising in the living room. I just assumed it was Chris and people from the bar and paid no mind. When the knocking on my door started, I would open the door to nobody but could still hear the vague sound of talking, thinking it's coming from the other room. I just threw some blankets or something in front of the door, since that always is what he would want at 3.30, until finally I got the distinct feeling of being watched and paranoid that the people were talking about me. I heard my doorknob clicks. It was as if it unlocked. Then I watched it slowly open. So thinking it was Chris again, I sat up. I nearly crapped the bed when I saw old George. He made a come here motion, which damn near gave me a heart attack. And I opened the door wider and pointed. I couldn't see the living room from where I was curled up. So I spun around to the foot of my bed and looked at my open window as a means of escape. What I saw was my living room, but not my room. That seemed familiar, but not. It looked like a party. Some people moved in a really fluid, natural way, and some were blinking here and there. In and out and side to side. They weren't translucent except for parts that moved through the sofa or walls, and I watched, completely terrified. George motioned again, but I shook my head, and he nodded with understanding and closed the door and all sounds stopped. The silence was deafening. All but my heart pumping gallons of adrenaline through my body. The high-pitched squeal of the emergency broadcast tone was in my head, until I calmed down hours later. After that, I didn't see George for months. I thought maybe I had hurt his feelings by declining his invitation, and at some point began to outright apologize occasionally, hoping he would hear. Eventually, things went back to normal. Cupboards banging and dishes clanking, old food containers in weird places until people would start asking about my granddad again. It was normal. Didn't feel malicious. And really happened. And that's that. Only thing I can remember is having a conversation with something that looked like my girlfriend, but ultimately wasn't. I believe something got disturbed in the land where my brother built his house. It was December 2008. My parents and I went to visit my older brother and his family for Christmas in their new place. I distinctly remember the first night. I went to bed after the long flight. The room felt ice cold, yet the heating was on high in the house, with there being a foot of snow outside. I remember abruptly waking up in the darkness of night to people shouting in my room. I opened my eyes wide and tried to rise up. However, a weight was on top of my entire body. The shouting stopped. In front of me was a face, a very old outline of a face with an expressionless look coming close to mine. It had a white outline with black features and the deepest eyes. I couldn't see any body, only the face. As quick as it came, it disappeared. I closed my eyes and was stiff with an unusual sense of something totally paranormal still with me, watching me. 
trying to get my attention for some reason. I was goosebumped all over, but I very quickly went back to sleep again. I woke up in the morning thinking, did I have a nightmare or did I actually wake up last night? What the hell was that? At breakfast, I couldn't help but tell everyone, even though I couldn't make sense of it. I was adamant on thinking back to the night that it definitely woke me up. I know I saw a face and the weight on me was something I physically felt. I remember telling my brother and he seemed like he didn't want to acknowledge it and brushed it off with no comment. I told everyone else that something didn't feel right in that room. I honestly believe it spooked my family. Anyway, we went on about our day and nothing more of it was talked about. Then comes something I'll never forget. The biggest family argument erupted in the house next night. Out of nowhere, my sister and sister-in-law get into a heated argument over one comment. My sister-in-law, who's such a sweet and chilled out person, turned into a demon. I'm not even exaggerating. Think of all the traits of someone being possessed. She was shouting at my mother close up in her face, her eyes popping out of her head. Hair seemed to get instantly messy. My brother had to restrain her. No one knew how it could escalate so crazily. All night, my brother held her down in bed. She was screaming and making weird noises that I could only relate to that of a possessed girl in a horror movie. My dad had to knock on the door of my brother and his wife's bedroom to see if they were okay. It disturbed me to think back onto this part of the night, as it was the one and only major family argument that's ever happened. The next day, I saw my brother cry for the first time in his life. Something in the house, in this area, did not want us here, and it's still there. For reference, I'm a huge wimp when it comes to anything paranormal, even though I am fascinated and love scary stories. My parents always made fun of me, since they are both uncommonly brave and sceptical. I also grew up in a city that used to be a part of Salem, Massachusetts. So, you know, I thought I would be desensitized to these eerie situations. Alas, I took after my grandmother, who we call Nonna. Despite being a tough, independent woman with a mouth like a sailor, she was also afraid of being alone, and of anything remotely creepy, no matter how improbable. I seemed to have inherited nearly everything from her, olive skin, short stature, and her fear of the supernatural. Because of this similarity, we were incredibly close. We would call each other and share whenever we experienced something that unsettled us, and just knowing that someone knew exactly how you were feeling made us feel better, and perhaps a little less foolish. Like many Italian Americans, she was superstitious. She once told me that my mother had suffered from malocchio, or the leave lie, as an infant. She confirmed this, the traditional way, by dropping three drops of olive oil into a bowl filled with water, when it formed an eye shape. She knew that my mum had malocchio, but this was cured, apparently with the administration of a traditional blessing upon diagnosis. Despite her superstitious beliefs, she was never fully sure whether ghosts existed. Like myself, she always chose to be on the side of caution and act as if they did just to be safe. This is perhaps why she proposed something unusual to me. During one visit, she insisted that she would come back if there were any way to let me know if ghosts are real. Being the fraidy cat that I am, I told her that as much as I love her, I didn't want her to come back as a ghost and visit. After all, I didn't want to be scared, but she persisted, promising that she wouldn't scare me. I was certain that this was not going to be possible, but as it turns out, I was wrong. Both Nonna and her husband, my papa, passed away within 12 hours of each other in 2007 from unrelated illnesses. With everything going on, I had forgotten all about her promise of proving the existence of spirits. It wasn't until a few months later that I started to experience some unexpected occurrences. I honestly can't remember the first time it happened, but at some point I began to realize that I could smell Nonna's perfume at random. She always wore Clinique Aromatics Elixir, which if you've ever smelled is incredibly pervasive and unmistakable. It's also not very common. No one in our family could smell this perfume without thinking of Nonna. 
Over the span of perhaps a few months, I would smell her perfume on a nearly daily basis, whether it be at work, in our home, and it would usually only last a short while. It was perhaps most unusual when I smelt it outside, with no one near me. Sometimes I would be alone, but often there were other people around. When I asked, sometimes those around me could smell it, and other times they couldn't. It wasn't consistent. If anything, it was comforting and subtle. And after a month, the smell abruptly stopped occurring. But ever since then, every few months, I will smell Nona's perfume someplace that doesn't make sense, like my house or my car. My husband never smells it when I do, but my son and mother almost always do. I'm not sure why this is the case, but it's certainly interesting. When people ask me if I believe in ghosts, or if I've ever had a paranormal experience, I tell them I no longer have the right to doubt, because Nonna went out of her way to make sure to answer the question for me. I miss her terribly, but it's a comfort to know that she may not be too far away, after all. Back in 1982, my mother and I moved into a two-bedroom duplex. I was 15 years old, and really into the band The Doors. I had read the book, No One Gets Out Alive, and I carried that book around everywhere I went like a Bible. We had to be in the duplex for about a week, when one night I was listening to the album, the soft parade on my record player, and I would listen to a few lines from a song and then write them down. I did this with all the songs to every Door album. I had a few notebooks filled with lyrics of the Door songs all written in black ink. I didn't own pencils. On this given night, I kept smelling men's cologne. It was almost as if it were being waved in front of my nose, to the point where I looked in my closet and under my bed and couldn't find the source. After a few minutes of scratching my head and wondering how it got there, I went to the kitchen to get a soda refill. When I came back to my room and picked up my notebook, and written in a young child's writing in pencil at the top of the page, it said, Why are you here? I went to my mum's room and showed it to her, and she said it must have been there when I started writing. I said to her I didn't own any pencils, and that I would have noticed it when I started writing. That place had stuff going on the whole time I lived there. I wasn't scared, but my friends would freak out. On our way home from a camping trip, my family stopped by the Oak Springs Trilobite site to fossil hunt. If you don't know the southeastern Nevada desert, the attractions are low to moderately traveled, and you will often be one of few visitors. This site in particular was empty, and we were the only ones there. A quarter mile trail leads you to a shale deposit where you can sift through for fossils. Shortly after starting out, I heard a man call out conversationally, not really shouting, but talking loudly enough to communicate with someone a distance away. I was facing west on a south facing slope and he sounded like he was down and to the left, closer to me than the highway. I paused and took a look around there was no dust or engine noises from overhead vehicles. No crunching of footsteps, nothing. No flies buzzing about. And decided a bug buzzed into my ear. A minute later, I hear another man call out. This time up the slope to my right. Probably another bug, I thought. Sounds can get funky in rocky canyons. No biggie. We came up on the site, dug around for a half hour. It was very hot and found few unimpressive specimens and headed back for the truck. At this point, I had forgotten all about the voices. Driving away, I asked my husband, what did you think? Pretty cool? I'm the rock hound and never knew if he enjoyed my hobby as much as I did. He went, sure, it was actually all right. But I kept hearing those voices and couldn't tell where they were coming from. He had a face shield up over his ears at the time making it unlikely that a bug could have buzzed in there. He said he kept hearing them on his way back to the truck and heard them calling out at least a few times. Caliente is nearby and Pioche is further away and both towns have histories dating back to ye old mining days and Mormon frontiering. 
There are lots of railroad, gunfights and native raid stories, and some really weird Warren Jeff type stuff. Not to mention that Area 51 is relatively close by. Now we are atheists and skeptics and don't believe in ghost stories, and neither of us have ever had a paranormal experience, but this one has us scratching our head. My computer also froze twice while trying to type this out, so I'm now attempting it on my phone. It's like something doesn't want us inquiring about it. In my old home, my dad had a heart attack and was hospitalized after a major surgery to save his life. He was put in a medically induced coma and we were anxiously waiting and hoping for him to pull through. My dad had a nightly ritual when he came home from work to peek his head into our rooms and make sure we were safe and sleeping. One night I was woken to the sound of someone walking in our home. I knew my grandma was sleeping on the couch and my mum was sleeping in my bed as I was eight. Suddenly the footsteps got closer and I saw a shadow figure peer in and look around. He checked the windows to make sure they were locked, straightened the blankets and walked out. I heard him walk from room to room and eventually fell back asleep. The next morning we discovered footprints in the house, but every door and window was still locked and shut. My dad woke up the day after that. I also saw my piano teacher's dead husband's spirit. So there's that. When I was 18, I was scrolling through Tumblr on my phone at 2am, giggling to myself since I shared a room with my brother. Then I heard a male voice down the aisle. It sounded like it was going towards the kitchen. It sounded like grumbling, like an angry kind of grumble, so I instantly assume it's my grouch of a dad. I felt a strange pressure on my chest. Then the sound gets louder and louder. Then suddenly the door to my parents' bedroom opens. And since it's an old door that pretty much is falling apart, it makes a popping sound as it opens. The sounds stop. And then I hear my dad go, Who's there? He opened my door and pretended to be asleep so he doesn't give me crap for being awake. He closes the door and went back to sleep. The next morning my mum asked me to put away the cereal if I got hungry and had food at night. When I asked why me, she told me my dad was angry because he found cereal on the floor and what looked like crushed cereal, like someone had stepped in it and just walked away. I got chills down my spine and told her what I heard last night. She then called a priest and sprinkled holy water everywhere before lighting up a few candles around the house. This is something that still gets to me to this day. One day I was playing video games in my room and I swore I heard my mum calling for me. I replied and she called again and I replied again, paused and went to investigate. No one was there, so I assumed my mum was yelling something about going out and she left. About an hour later, I heard my door, and again my mother was yelling for me. I had a quick convo of, I'll be there in a bit. Wait, wait, fine, I'm coming. Assuming she came back and needed help, I finally went down, but no one was there. The thing is, this was not one of those, did I hear someone call me or what? And I wasn't playing anything scary then or earlier. I was playing Super Smash Bros all day, but I had a cleaner and distinct conversation with something. And later when my mum finally got home, she said she never tried to get my attention at all when she left the house before. Lame, I know. But I've always had weird connections to the other side, whether it's planes, dimensions or death. 